Perry. Yeah, you guys did really well, though, rebounding on that. Thanks. Yeah, it was hard because it was like the uh, we didn't know how to quickly communicate to everyone, but right. it seemed like everyone kind of passed the word around nicely. Yeah, it was fine. Even Tom A was able to get back on it. <laughs> okay, now what it looks laughing. like it's going. I can see the little um, the little icon saying it's streaming. I'm gonna flip over to YouTube quick and just do a little test to see if it's up there. I'm looking at it, it just says the GT red um, screen, but maybe it's loading still. Oh, you know what it might be? So it's scheduled for two o'clock, I believe. So that might be it. I'll text Forrest right now, because he can see on the back end if it's, if it's like enabled, but then I think it will start to broadcast once it opens up at two. Okay. I'll check with him though quick. Okay. You should be good to go, though. It says live on custom live streaming service, right? That's what it should say. Yeah. Up on left. yeah. Yep. You should be good to go. And then once um once everyone gets in here and you start doing the introductions, uh, just remember to oh, record. record. Yep, that'd be the only other thing just to take note on. That's in the um, upper left, right? No, where is record? Oh, bottom. There at the bottom. Yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah, so that'd be the last thing. I just texted Forrest and he just got back to me saying that you are all good to go and it's up and running. Okay. Um, so you... Oh yeah, I can see it now. We're both, we're live. I think there's another one that's, and Christy just got on as well. So you are rock and rolling. And then, yeah, if you, here, I'll throw in the chat just directly to you in my, um, my phone numbers. So if anything does happen. Hey. It's me. We're good. Great. Sweet. So that is, that's both of our phone numbers. So if you um, run into any issues, feel free to shoot us a text or give us a call. And we'll Almost figure done. it out together. <laughs> Getting there. <laughs> Almost. Great job, by the way. Great Thank job. you. Much appreciated. Yeah, have a great review and uh, let us know if you run into any issues. Thanks. All right, talk to you later. Renee, is that you? Hey, John. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks for being prompt. <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, I would check in, see everything worked out. Yeah, on the planet. Let me get rid of the Can filter. You see it? Yeah. That's better. I'll just, uh, all right. So how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, I think I, this is my first time live. By the way, we are live streaming right now. So you are on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're not being recorded yet, but we are being live streamed. We, we are going to record the jury too. So uh, this is the last session of the weekend. And this is my first time, you know, running a group. So I'm right. super paranoid that I'm going to mess up the live stream because these, some of these students have relatives that are watching, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. so I think I'm more nervous than my students. Like I've been like, 
training to live stream for like three days. So <laughs> yeah, you'll be fine. I think you'll be fine. All right. Let me. Uh, I'm just gonna mute and uh, turn some things off. Sure thing. Hi, Pri, can you hear me? Hi. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Um, you all ready? Yeah. Good. I'm excited to see your project. I'm excited to see my project too. We just had a great morning session. It was really, really Yeah, fantastic. I listened to like a couple of them and they went really well. So I'm pretty excited yeah, to see yeah. this guys. It was really fun. Uh, Julia and uh, Ozan did really great. It was really, really fantastic. And uh, one, two, three, four. Let's see here. What time is your review supposed to be? You're after Zoe, right? After Zoe. Yeah. So I'm at 425. 4 435. Okay, got it. Yeah. And then Lorenzo's later. Yep, he's after me. Right. So it's not 435, he's at 520. It's a misprint on, on one of them. I can't believe like it's been two years already. Michael, hello. <laughs> How are you? You're muted. <laughs> hey, I'm good. I'm good. Am I? Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I was very excited to take part. So thank you. Yeah. Hi, Zoe. Hi, Bowen. Hi, Yixin. We're just assembling everyone here. We'll wait a few minutes as people come in. Renee's here. Um, but, but hey, offline, Renee. Off screen for a moment. Hey, Michael. How are you? Hey. Are you in uh, San Diego, Tijuana, Nebraska? <laughs> um, Norman, Oklahoma. 
Okay, right. I'm sorry, Oklahoma. Yeah, Norman. <laughs> okay, right. right. I, uh, I I do want to let everyone know, and I'll be saying this a lot. We are live streaming right now on YouTube. Thank you. Miroslava, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm so excited. This is my first and last, I guess, session of, of your pieces. So I'm, I'm really, really excited to see. Um, you, it's always such a fun, well, it's such a fun event, always alive. And now this is, this is just, as, just as fun, I have to say, because I was popping in and out of some sessions, but um, yeah, how, how are you doing? This is like oh, your we're last- doing great. <laughs> this is the last group. There's three groups going simultaneously. So this is one of three. I, I'm incredibly nervous because this is my first time live streaming, which we are live streaming <laughs> right now. And I'm nervous on behalf of all my students because they have all their relatives who want to watch their reviews. And if I screw this thing up, I'm way more nervous than they are right now. I've been training for it for like three days. Right. <laughs> I'm one, sure of my, one of my right. students said, are you doing the live stream? Hey, not to. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, normally we would be, you know, I said in the morning session, normally everyone would be slightly under the weather from the party the night before at, at my house <laughs> that we usually have for outside jurors. And uh, I woke up this morning and, you know, I still, had the hang I still had the hangover, <laughs> but not the mess. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I could only imagine. Yeah. yeah, I remember the last year, and it was it was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, we had, always have a lot of fun there. Yeah. I remember uh, uh, so celebrations at Ming Vung's home. Right. That those were pretty unique. Uh, if you've been hanging out in New York too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now we're using buses and Uber, which is much safer. Um, <laughs> we're waiting for Zhu, uh, Andy to be with us, Drake. Uh, almost have everybody. Hey, Eli. Morning, John. Got it all together? All teed up? Yeah, I'm glad to hear that you're more nervous than I am. <laughs> or maybe well, not. not. I'm not glad to not, hear Not yet. Are you okay? Well, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, we are streaming. That is successful. So that, in fact, I got it to work. But yesterday in Devin's group, it went down twice and we had to completely reinvite everyone on Zoom and then, you know, reconnect and do it all. So, but, so if that happens, don't worry. We have plenty of time. We can pause it. And uh, I have two tech people whose cell phone numbers I have. Kyle and Ferris, they've been great. They've been really good actually. Okay, we've got some people that are late. Let me just check one thing.
to send it out again. Still waiting. There's Andrew. Yes. He's on. Okay, I think we're waiting for Drake and Shu. Renee, how, how the hell are you doing, Renee? Hey, Michael Bell. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Andy, how are you? You know, can't complain. <laughs> I think I need to go put my suit on. Okay. <laughs> you know, just uh, it's an inside joke. <laughs> I remember Skyping with you during MoMA foreclosed. Oh, there's and, uh, Drake. Hi, uh, Drake. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Hey. I'm good, good, good. Here, okay. here we are on, on Saturday afternoon. Yes. Well, as many of you may know, this is, you know, the, the end of, of, of graduate thesis, but the beginning of the school year. So, you know, we actually hold graduation tomorrow and all of our undergraduate students who graduated in the spring come back and uh, we'll have graduation, of course, virtually uh, tomorrow, but we're looking wow. forward to it. Um, I'm gonna start, uh, we have until about 2.15. Um, Andrew just hosted the session before this, so he, he really helped me out and prepared me for uh, uh, how to do it. Uh, we'll, we'll say because these reviews are on schedules and uh, family members are dialing in because this is being uh, live streamed on YouTube right now, so everyone should know. Uh, I'm also to record, which I'm going to start doing right now. And um, uh, we're going to really keep time. So if we're going a little too long, I'll, I will I will shorten it. And if we're if we're done early, we're going to lengthen it uh, so that uh, <laughs> the people because uh, all the time slots are set. We have 45 minutes uh, for for each uh, project, and you're seeing um, uh, four. Uh, sorry, no five, five projects, six students. There's one team project, and. Um, uh, three of the projects are my students and, and two are Andrew Zago's students. Um, so it'll be uh, 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 Eli followed by Bowen and Nijing, who are my students. Uh, then uh, Zoe and Pri will, will, will go for Andrew. And then uh, Lorenzo will, will, will wrap us up, who's my student. So we will uh, uh, be done at six o'clock sharp, uh, uh, six oh five, something like that. Uh, with some rooms for some, you know, final comments. Uh, in lieu of introductions, if we were in person, I would be standing next to you and introduce you. But in this format, uh, we'd like you to introduce yourselves because this is also part of the streaming and then you can speak and the, uh, the students can see who, who you are. So uh, I'll call on you and if you could introduce yourself, that would be fantastic. So in the order of uh, on my screen, I have Renee up here first. So Renee, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Yes. Um, well, hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Renee Peralta. I'm an architect. I'm originally from Tijuana. Um, I used to mm, teach at Woodbury University, and I've also done a couple of courses at SIARC on Latin American uh, architecture. And I'm currently the... Um, um, a fellow at the University of Oklahoma uh, School of Architecture, the Gibbs School of Architecture. So um, thank you for inviting me. And you are there now in Oklahoma? I'm Yes, I'm right here in Norman, Great. Oklahoma. Great. One of the thesis students who was in my thesis prep is from Norman. He went to school uh, there. Oh, uh, I, I, well. I assume Andrew is watching right now, but we don't know. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Florencia just joined us too. Hi, Florencia. Francia, I successfully am, am streaming. I'm very proud of myself. Excellent. Uh, I'm so proud of. Let me just say hi because <laughs> I'm, jumping, I'm just coming yeah. in to say hi and I'm moving to another reviews and then to the green room. So I wanted to sure. thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, John, for coordinating. This is the last, I, I think you said already, but this is the last 
group. I mean, there's three groups this afternoon and then that's it. Students graduate tomorrow. So they close this cycle um, within this time, uh, this strange time. So I wanted to thank you. Thank you, Rene, for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Michael. I love the photo. Uh, Andrew, I have to send you a photo because Michael was in a review, I think, what, two years ago? No, um, I actually, I went by the I'm thesis I'm going to share show. on the share. Yes. I, uh, I went by the thesis show at 10 p.m. all alone, and I saw the Dagwood. Oh. And, I, and I could ne I always wanted to talk to Wait a second, what is it? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I have sent it. it to Florencia today because I really had a lot to say about that, but I saw it all alone. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to put it in the chat. Let me see if I can just bring it to the chat. No, I have to download it. Jerry made for there. me. But it's so funny because he remembered that? the new Dagwood. <laughs> I have a, under glass here, I have a version of it. <laughs> Fantastic. Florencia will forward your comments to you. <laughs> yeah, he's my comment. You know, very, very poetic of, um, okay, I got it. It's right there. So I just put it up. So thank you, Michael, for all those memories. You know, this has been an, an amazing email exchange this day. Hi, Mirka. Thank you for joining us. Look, Mirka, she's almost a percentage sire. She has a background, everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're thank you so much for inviting me. I'm super happy to be here. <laughs> You're always welcome to, you know, we adopt you anytime, as you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm always, always happy to join. Thanks for joining Thank us. And Natu, she was, you know, she was in, in you know, you guys in the, the student step a year ago, and now she's a mm. professor here at Sayer. So welcome to Sayer, Natu, and thank you for joining us. Thank and Drake, you. we're here again. Thank second you, Drake, time. so much. Second time. Yeah, second you know, time. Like, yes, yeah, yeah. He's, a, yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's a trooper, you know, he keeps on joining you know so thank you so much for joining us and i hope you You're enjoy welcome. this welcome. this afternoon so so there you go uh, andrew did you see the image did you download it it's hilarious yeah. <laughs> he's neil neil is like asking a question or something like that so it's very yeah. funny <laughs> okay i won't interrupt anymore thank you everybody thanks friends yeah hoping later to say bye bye so, bye thank you bye. thank you so uh, next up, Drake, could you please introduce yourself? And thank you so much for coming. Sure. How, do I have like 20 minutes, 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were making a comment about architects having no time to talk or not enough time. <laughs> anyway, my name is Drake Dillon, architect with Perkins and Will. I'm also a uh, uh, past national president for NOMA, National Organization of Minority Architects. I, I come to California by way of... Uh, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and also Howard University in Washington, D.C. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Drake. Nice you. Uh, next on my grid, uh, I have Miroslava Brooks. Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Miroslava Brooks, also known as Mirka, as Florencia just uh, called me, <laughs> to friends and family. Um, I am an architect uh, with a practice in New York City called Forma. Uh, former architects, and uh, I've been teaching at the Yale School of Architecture for a series of years now, um, and a few classes also at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Next thank up, you. not not too far, not too, please introduce yourself, although you already had Ferencia kind of give you Right. Hi, hi, everyone. I'm Nachu Fall. I'm a makeup artist and art director in LA and a new faculty at SciArc. And of course, recent grad, I graduated from the MRF1 program last year. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Michael Bell. Hey, okay. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I teach at Columbia. Uh, I've been there. I've been at Columbia for 20 years. But honestly, I spent about 12 of my years before that in California. Well, 12 in California, six in Texas. So uh, I still feel more like a Westerner. And I've been around CyArc so many times over the years, but not so much recently. Um, but I, I think that, that that's enough. Yeah, we can get to the students. Nice to meet everybody who I haven't met yet. Great. I'm a graduate of Berkeley. Uh, and taught there for years. So I really have it all in my blood. Yeah. And we still Fantastic. have you back. 
And we still, uh, we yeah. don't hold that against you. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, well, here it is, two fifteen, which is the exact time we want to start uh, with our with our first uh, student who's up. So with that, um, and I'll remind everyone, we are live streaming, and I am recording this, uh, so the, the students will have access to that. And uh, uh, here we go. Uh, uh, next up is uh, Eli Rabin. Eli. The floor and hey Eli, nice to see you. Hi Andrew, I saw a row of red X's outside of Cyar to indicate the six feet between people entering, and I <laughs> thought of you. <laughs> prescient, <laughs> we were prescient. <laughs> um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about panopticons. Panopticons are buildings which afford complete visual access to the entire interior. So for example, the Guggenheim Museum allows visitors the views of the opposite half of the entire main exhibit from any point on the spiral gallery. John Portman, from whose fertile brow sprouted the seeds of parametricism, designed urban lobbies like Los Angeles's Bonaventura Hotel with enormous atriums that offer broad applicable. One effect of the subject-object viewing relationships that these buildings may give some degree of relative empowerment or advantage to a privileged place of viewership. So theaters, such as the Vienna State Opera House, give unobstructed views of the house from the stage. So in this case, uh, the unique symbiotic relationship between the voyeuristic audience and the exhibitionist performer makes a single place of privilege tricky to assign Nevertheless, this relationship mediated through the line of sight can be strengthened or weakened architecturally. The Reichstag building, government building in Berlin grafted a system of walkways and mirrors to put the German parliament on display, humbling the government to the community it serves and interested visitors. Of course, the government is still running the country, but the viewers can enjoy the privilege of watching them do it. In the case of panoptic prisons, such as Go Joliet in Chicago, a tower in silo optimizes the behavioral monitoring and control. So the present proposal tests whether a panoptic design can be applied to the unlikely program of a hospital. So why a hospital? There are two reasons. One is that ill health puts patients at a disadvantage to begin with. There's a place for addressing medical crises, the efficiency and safety of the design is an ethical rather than just a utilitarian imperative. But such concerns often yield designs with rows of rooms packed along corridors that are not so different from prisons. And such environments may amplify the sense of disadvantage in patients coping with involuntary passivity. So this project tries to attenuate that. The second reason uh, for doing hospitals is that nowadays, even medical protocols based on evidence of rigorous science is subject to the strange negations and denials common in today's cultural discourse. So if the architecture of institutions that embody evidence-based technical know-how can strengthen their side of the argument through a more compelling civic presence, then I'd like to make some of that. So in other words, hospitals mediate two main visual exchanges, internally between the facility and the patients and outwardly between the facility and the community. And this proposal deploys and subverts panoptic building design to strengthen the position of patients within the hospital and the hospital within the community. So my site is a hole in the ground. It's in the upper west, uh, sorry, the upper, upper Manhattan. Um, it, uh, it's a hole over here. It contains a tunnel for I-95 that runs between the Bronx and New Jersey. The neighborhood is mainly residential, but with the highway running through it. Between the Washington and Hamilton bridges on each end of the highway are a bus depot and four residential bridge towers built in 1960. But east of those towers is the empty city block containing a block's worth of uncovered highway. So the hospital site is meant to broadcast a positive message about the value of know-how within the community and also from the community to the commuters driving between New Jersey and Westchester. So, here is this hospital. Um, outside there is a structural lattice um, that extends down into the highway. This way it treats the highway itself 
as the building's public space, unifying the street and the highway levels and allowing drivers to pass through the building or be stuck in traffic in it as the case may be. So here you can see the highway beneath the lattice. Here's looking at it from the west facade opposite to what we just saw. And here's seeing it from the highway itself as a commuter might see it driving west. So the form of this building uh, is derived from and plays against the panopticon uh, to you know, rebalance any hierarchy within it. So here's a diagram of the panopticon Joliet prison cylinders. Uh, so intersection of the panopticon cylinders would violate the hierarchical relationship because they aren't separate anymore. So for the, oop, something's out of order. All right. Just a slide. Um, so for the proposed buildings, um, there are, instead of using uh, the cylinders, we're using two coiling uh, structures that are sort of intersected. And then this is fit into the city block by cropping it. And so the crop cuts three sides to fit the edge condition of the city block. So the cut three sides allows the buildings to interface the city grid. And then the uncut side leaves a more organic surface showing the crease between the two nestled masses to face the park and the spaghetti of the I-95 exit ramps. So the discontinuity between the curved and flat facade elements can be read as a kind of incomplete boundary which plays against the prison type. And the flat facades have holes, edges, corners that are exposed, and this plays against the prison type, but also exposing tectonics that express the technical character of the hospital. You can see here in the cut uh, section, the, the highway passing beneath it. Um, all right, this extends the model and you can see the, uh, the highway and the park on the face that doesn't have the flat surface. All right, let me um, run a few animations. So, Looking at the volumes more uh, carefully, you get this kind of effect. It's sort of a K-shaped profile in which the lobby on the bottom is mirrored by the uh, cantilever on the top. And here you can see the face off the grid, the two nestled volumes. And as the thing clips back, you can see Atria on the inside and the local atria as well as the big one. And All right, this freezes the section and you can see how the different um, grids fit together and hear how the, um, the different grids of the facade stitch together from the inside. All right, so hospital programs um, typically can be uh, broadly divided into inpatient clinical zones, shown here in beige, where the patients sleep. The outpatient consulting clinical zones, where they don't sleep, they just come to visit, and the support spaces, which would contain offices, labs, administration, laundry kitchens, et cetera, and these areas don't have any patients in them. So two ways of changing the patient's relationship to the institution is integrating the program, particularly the patient and the support areas, and exposing those support, oops, exposing those support areas um, to the patients by removing the walls and adjusting the floor heights. So typically in the interest of efficiency for building infrastructure, these three zones are kept separate with the patient rooms in one area and the clinical consulting support areas somewhere else. So this may be a programmatic compromise. For example, the surgery department may have operating rooms, examination rooms, offices, and inpatient beds all in separate areas of the hospital dedicated to those things. So reorganizing the program by department rather than the type of the facilities, and that's what's diagram here, all right, makes for more convenient you know, for the patient. And it also puts the patient closer to the aspects of the hospital organization that's providing, providing the treatment. So they also raise the standard of care by bringing the various collaborating clinicians and caregivers in closer touch with one another. 
So let me take you through the distributed program. Um, so first, here are here are uh, the areas throughout the building dedicated to medical procedures, each on the appropriate floor. Then let's overlay areas for surgeries, and then the consulting exam rooms. And these are all these things are enclosed for the privacy of the patient. And then in between these areas are the exposed working places for meetings, administration, cleaning, and washing. Wrapped around that are the patient's room, the patient rooms for each of the uh, department's inpatients. These are just the rooms. This shows the ICU, the intensive care units. All right, also, as every hospital must have, is access. Uh, so here's a driveway on the street level uh, with access to the service areas and also the emergency room at that street level. There are three vertical circulation cores, one, uh, one large one for general purpose, and then one dedicated service area uh, that in the back that goes to the refuse and the morgue areas, and then a smaller one in here connecting the emergency room to the main volume of the building. Here's all the circulation. Here's the complete emergency department towards the bottom of the building. And then here are facilities for imaging, radiology, interventional radiology, labs, and these are sort of public spaces. Here we have the lobby. Here are a series of terraces that are embedded in the lattice, the pharmacy, and then the eating uh, for visitors and staff. Um, on the floor. So here's a diagram of a typical hospital floor. So the highlighted areas are where the patients go. They have the rooms on the periphery and circulation in between. Here I'm highlighting the, the clinical spaces where they receive specialized treatment. And then in between are all the other office administrative labs, et cetera, that are open and sunken. So this way the patients can look down and into the support areas as they circulate. And this will connect the patients to the work of the hospital and elevate the patients within it. Uh, so you have spaces like this here. You have rooms on the periphery. Uh, you've got um, the, you know, the office and support areas that are sunken in these red areas that they can, patients can look down and into. Um, here we have a large atrium that facilitates panoptic views within the building. Another view. And let me finish off with an animation. Um, Showing the exterior, you can see the lattice there, dipping down into the highway. You can see the exposed edges, the holes on the, on the facades. This is looking at the, the west elevation in the back. You can look down and see the highway. Well, that's it.
Thanks very much. How much time do we have? Um, 30 minutes? Sorry, yes, we have 30 minutes. Plenty of time. Great, yeah, just a gauge, yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I don't mind, uh, go on. Uh, I, I was gonna say the same thing as you. If no one wanted to jump in, I will. Uh, Drake, please, yeah, or, or not. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, I will confess, um, I am a healthcare architect. <laughs> I design I design hospitals. I was going to say, isn't that a real Perkins and Will specialty? <laughs> That's correct. That's, That's correct. Glad you went good. before me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, but in, in the spirit of, of uh, being creative and, and supporting, uh, this is very interesting uh, overall, you know, design approach. Um, um, when I was, when you were showing the uh, overall elevations of it, uh, particularly how it 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 uh, stacked next to the exist existing buildings, it became almost like a bookend for for the the four or three towers that were there before. And I thought that was a very interesting approach from just a site massive um, siting plan per se. Uh, I, I was also really drawn into how you address issues that I have every day in designing hospitals. So so part of the reality of me was, was trying to see how you creatively address some of those things, which in some cases you did. Uh, and sometimes it's always good to see things from, from a fresh a point of view. Uh, I, I was originally torn, I must admit, when you were talking about the prisons and, and, and hospitals, because I will, I will confess that I'm, I don't think we should be designing prisons. I'm against that, but, but, but that's just me. But, but you were not going there. You kind of just took some overall concepts. Um, when it comes to being functional, and maybe this is a question for you. Um, did you really get into the the mechanics of uh, your plumbing? You know, and how did it line up? How did it function? Um, your 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 MEP in general, uh, structural obviously can be you know dealt with in, in different ways. But I'm just curious functionally. Did you think about plumbing at all? Yeah, I did. Um, not in great detail, but um, you know, there's there, you know, in the diagram that I showed earlier, if I can dial that up. Um, you know, all right, here's a generic hospital, and where you have the three areas. And they're separated, you know, very discreetly into big volumes. And you know, in my design, everything is kind of stacked. It doesn't follow the pattern shown here, but you know, for example, I'm going, oh, I'm going the right direction. But you know, the rooms, you know, the rooms are on the periphery. They've all got their little bathrooms, and that plumbing kind of stacks. And then you know, this kind of stuff on the inside, uh, it doesn't stack perfectly, but there's some consistency and the walls do line up. So it would be possible to run stuff up and down. Oh, okay, okay. So the patient's rooms are more on, in the center. So you have the ability to stack better. No, the, the, the contrary, the patient rooms are on the periphery and then the facilities, the procedure rooms for procedures and consulting are in the middle. I but there's, there's, a ver there's a vertical um, you know, continuity, let's say. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought it's, it's an interesting approach to healthcare, very different, uh, which, which, is, which is nice to see uh, um, and very creative. Uh, the interior space is very, very, obviously very wide open. You know, healthcare is changing so much. Um, I mean, the old way of doing things obviously is the past. 
and, and even the, day, the way we do things today is constantly changing because of technology. Uh, it's just gonna be so much different. So you, you're kind of alluding to some of that here, which I think is kind of good in a way. Uh, the future is, is different. So, uh, but I think it's a good job, very good job. Appreciate it. Thank you. Can, can I just, I, I, you know, as the faculty, I'm not gonna jump in much here, but this is really fascinating. And, and Draco, it's, it's nice to meet you, but I thought, why? Wow, this is the perfect juror. <clears throat> because I, all I know about, <clears throat> there's a certain kind of specialization in architecture and healthcare represented for the, the few years when I was in New York at City College, my office, I was um, renting space from an architect named uh, Norman Rosenfeld. And uh, that's basically was his field. The, that office mm -hmm. had passed away a few years ago, but mm -hmm. for a while it was quite a large office. And he only did healthcare. And I, I know, and a good friend of mine worked uh, at, at Perkins and Will when they did the UCLA hospital. Sure. And I spent some time there recently when, when uh, my child was born. And I know that Perkins and Will is a little bit of an exception because typically the idea that there's a, a firm with a design profile, the old, like the first thing if to get a hospital, first thing you have to do is know how to do a lot of hospitals or you don't get chosen as, as, I, as I understand it. And so Perkins and Will tends to push that into, you know, we had Le Corbusier gets hired to do a hospital in Venice and had never done one before and that simply doesn't happen today. And so there is something quite brave, uh, Eli, uh, uh, about taking on such a yeah. complicated and such a specialized, at this point, specialized right. technology. Drake, does uh, Diana Davis work with you, uh, Perkins and Will? She was a Rice uh, graduate student years ago, but she ended up at Perkins and Will. Her master, uh, this isn't a personal question, her master's degree was dealing with Michel Foucault and biopower and questions of the state intervening and having control over one's body. But Diana ah. was, uh, she had done a lot of work with Stanford Quinter back then and I myself, and, but she literally then morphed into that. I, I bring that up not as a tangent. Eli, I really enjoyed your presentation and I, I just have a feeling you're very uh, into the project in a way that's quite sincere and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, 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 it's enjoyable to hear it the way you uh, show it as well. Um, yeah. I, I made fun of my New Yorkness. I am a New Yorker, but like I say, I've got been in many other places. But your project brings up something I think about New York that's uh, pretty. I think you're maybe you're from New York as well because I think you're picking up on something about a city like that. Um, it's places where buildings and infrastructure begin to merge, and the GW Bridge and those four apartment towers and the Nervi bus terminal all are one of them in a very explicit way. Robert F. Kennedy, when he was Senator from New York was part of suing all the Port Authority and other parts of New York because all the fumes that were coming up into those buildings and equity issues about that and who lived in those buildings. So you, you probably know they don't work as well as one would think. But another aspect of it, I think that you are picking up on, I think Drake's comments on the inside are, are something I wouldn't know how to speak to. Some of these buildings are, are of such a scale they don't fit in the normative city grid and whether it's Tisch Hospital or Lincoln Center, which of course comes from clearing. But I think your project and a lot of the hospitals do end up next to major arterials, all the, the three hospitals on the East River do. And they span uh, the, the river on the, the highway on the east side. But the degree to which these buildings in a way become larger than the traditional city, they start to become infrastructure and then they, you know, one could say they have to merge the two. What I think is interesting about yours is it's almost designed to drive by. And there is an aspect when you go by these large buildings, especially if you're driving in a busy, busy city. I mean, New York is busy, but so is LA, of course. But in New York, you, you really are have to focus quite a bit in front of and behind you. It's a different type of congestion maybe than Los Angeles. But I think your building starts to kind of really interesting evolution of the Panopticon buildings from the Guggenheim to the Reichstag. So in other words, you would still be a distracted driver, but you would start to become aware. And I don't want to make too much of a, it is too much of a stretch, but you're not one of, the reason I bring up Diana Davis Drake was she was working with Michel Foucault, but she didn't want to footnote him. She said he was in the water thereby. You don't have to footnote him. Everybody's Foucaultian. Um, so Drake, Eli, you don't, you know, this was 20 years ago, but Eli, you don't bring them up either, but of course the birth of the clinic and the idea that medicine starts to become scientific and the right. doctor's the doctor's kind of ability to analyze and to envision is, 
is stabilized and no longer so sociological. I think it's, it's, that's true about prisons. That's true to a certain extent, of course, about hospitals and Rossi and others noted that too. So, but what I think is, I think your project is like intuitively, I, I mean, I know you produced it through careful thought and analysis, but I do think in a large way, intuitively, it's a mass that starts to come down due to kind of duress on the outside. And from the inside, it's it's a panopticon that is cropped and starts to come apart. And in a way, it's I, I loved your interior perspectives because you show the you show the gurneys and the tables and the lamps. And in a way, it's like a different grain of instrument is left. The rooms have been cropped, and they kind of optically and spatially, volumetrically dissolve, maybe. And what's left is the next stuff. And that's where Drake, I, I think your comment is really interesting because. Of course, like, uh, you know, all of us have been around hospitals at various times. I was just with my mother in the hospital for four days, uh, helping her get through something. And I was looking at all the Rubbermaid nurses carts and, uh, you know, they hold the battery, they hold the computer, they hold the keyboard. And right. then they kind of look a little like Mickey Mouse. Um, right. You know, they're made to look cute so they don't scare children, I guess. But right. so Eli, I, I think your project is, uh, in terms of architects who I think capture some of what you're about, I, I used to think Jesse Reiser and Nanako Umamoto had really absorbed those kind of mega bridges, you know, and the elevated freeways of New York and had, made, you know, the, the old Croton River Aqueduct project by Stan Allen, Jesse, Nanako, and Polly Apfelbaum. Anyway, I talked too much here, but um, it's, I think it's quite an achievement for, uh, for a couple months and, it's, it would be a refreshing kind of way to experience New York, uh, hybridizing car. You know, other people like Vishan Chakravarti are calling for banning cars from New York. I think you're, you know, we're doing a pretty interesting job of suggesting mobility motion, the vector of motion could find another way of hybridizing. It wouldn't have to be cars. Sorry, I'm not being, uh, John, if you expect me to be critical here, I'll come around a second time. But the first, the, <laughs> well, first, time, you guys. the first time I'm finding it very right. intuitively refreshing. Um, uh, the, the critical question I would ask is, you know, do you need a tighter grain of theory either in your presentation or in your thinking, maybe it's there and you're not telling us to parse prison hospital because Drake's got a point here. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in on the things that you just started to allude to because yeah, I am yeah. having a little bit um, a little bit of a harder time uh, kind of thinking about your project Eli. and maybe like you can um, you can help us or you can help me at least um, understand what you're after because I, I was a little bit thrown off by the panopticon at the very beginning, which was basically like the first five or so slides, and then you, you know, it kind of disappeared, um, and we jumped into the hospital design. And so, a very simple question is: Are you more interested in the typology of the panopticon or the typology of the hospital? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not a tricky question. I'm just trying to understand, you know, like kind of then understand and and cater my. Uh, comments and thoughts, you know, based on, based on that. Yeah. Can I, can I follow up on that? Um, yep. uh, what Miroslav was saying. And um, but before that, I remember um, Jeff Kibnis once told us uh, hospitals and uh, schools, uh, they're too important, shouldn't be designed by architects. <laughs> um, but <laughs> they, they are difficult. And uh, in regards to the panopticon uh, initial concept, and uh, I also I'm wondering um, how is it used, uh, and because I I see it and I don't see it. Um, is it a conceptual um, instrument or uh, maybe a diagrammatic one, uh, which then the, it becomes a little bit uh, problematic. Uh, and or is it a formal one? Uh, so I think I'm lost between you trying to do the three of them at the same time. And that's where I, I, I find it a little bit uh, difficult to, when I'm inside and outside, trying to see a clear concept of that. Now, uh, as you know, hospitals uh, uh, usually are designed by in the inside. They are 
they're done by space planners. Uh, there is a lot of, um, uh, let's say, uh, programming that, that needs to be done that eventually later, once the space planners are done with it, they give it to an architect and then they just uh, you know, add a facade to it. So it, it is interesting to see, it would be interesting to see how sort of a uh, mostly programming, a spatial interior programming would eventually also correspond to the concept and see if that even works uh, for a hospital today. So uh, I guess I, I'm also a little bit like Minoslava trying to understand how the concept of the panopticon uh, tends to become basically a, a conversation starter or does it actually pull itself all the way through the building, all the way through the project, I, I might say. So Renee, um, and I mean, Eli, collect, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I'm reading your project is that the panopticon is actually more of like a formal investigation or it served as a diagram to get to the form of your building rather than um, its function inside the hospital. Uh, yes, what I saw, yeah. Right. Um, my, uh, my, I mean, another question I'm having is just in terms of its like, um, I guess its ability to like function really, just given how you've in that diagram separated out the chunks because I mean, like everyone has been saying um, with hospitals, there's a lot of like MEP that has to be coordinated in terms of like, you know, air qualities, like for sanitary purposes, all of these things. And in the diagram you've created all like the systems that would need to be like added to the building for it to function fully as a hospital would be incredibly redundant. Um, and, you know, it's sort of the interiors you've created are so open. I don't know how or where those systems would actually like live to sort of be um, hidden or not like on display. Um. All right, which question should I answer first? Um, let me start about the Panopticon stuff. So um, the, the idea of the Panopticon is uh, deployed to um, you know, give the patients in the hospital something to look at other than the hallway walls, basically. Um, and, you know, the, you know, the, the double loaded corridors that make up many, many hospitals, you know, they're very, it's, it is of course um, extremely efficient, but it's also a bummer. And when it's at its worst is when it can be compared to a prison. Now, comparing a prison to a hospital isn't really a big deal because prisons, hospitals, dorms, hotels, they're all just buildings that have lots of little rooms that are off of hallways. They're, they're all kind of the same building in a way. Eli, can I, mean, I just jump in? Sorry, like I mean, these are such strong. Like I'm like, wow, like hospital and prison is the same. Like, yeah, is it? Like, <laughs> I would love, you know, like I'm. It's like such a polemical statement for for that to kind of be believable. I would love to then see basically fifty or hundred uh, case studies that you looked at and kind of understood you know, the organization of the hospital versus the organization of the prison and really point out at the kind of aspects that you are kind of comparing those two typologies to. Because well, I would, you know, I, 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 like you cannot just say that a hospital and a, and a prison are the same because they have a double loaded corridor. Also, well, I, I would think say- if, if, Yeah, if I read it uh, correctly, you're right, Miroslava, but I, it could, he could have been sort of saying that uh, maybe they're hit, like, again, if you go back to Foucault, and they're heterotopia. So in a heterotopia, it's either a hospital or it's either prison, right? So maybe that would be a similarity, but I don't know if he was going there, but you're right. Well, I also, I mean, I look, I think like, I would love to talk to you. I, I would love to kind of look at your project outside of the panopticon. I would love to just like put it on a shelf and then just evaluate it as, as, as architecture, because I think there are actually really interesting moments. I actually really like this view, particularly because the underside of the floor plates and the underside of, I, I don't, I, it's a little bit harder to read, but it's this kind of swooping surface becomes really important. And it almost becomes a, a um, kind of, uh, 
an aspect of a building that we typically don't think of because this is the primary view through which public, as you mentioned, would experience it. I love that you mentioned that the highway is the public space in your case. Um, so I would really think about like, how does this public, which is really mobile, uh, experiences this building, right? Um, and I would then maybe pay a little bit more attention to really these, the ceilings and the surfaces uh, that are exposed to this semi-new public, so to speak. Um, I also love the kind of staggered interior checkerboard. If you can go to one of your atrium views, maybe, which reminds me, by the way, a little bit of Yale School of Architecture, the, the yeah. orange carpet and the, you know, <laughs> the staggered the floors feeling. and everything, yeah. right, uh, <laughs> which I love so already. I love your, you know, images, uh, obviously, but... Um, but I think there is something really interesting uh, happening here where you do get to have this, you know, multi views and multi kind of who is being seen, who is being viewed, who is viewing whom. I think that maybe is getting to potentially what originally you were trying to get to. Uh, so I would actually encourage you to maybe capitalize on some of these interiors a little bit more. Um, and then, um, Lastly, you know, there is something about, I mean, you spend probably quite a bit of time in thinking about where is the glass wall versus where is the solid wall, right? Because that really kind of starts to really mediate the view that you are carefully composing with the floor plates. And so I would love to actually hear a little bit more about that and the materiality of your structure, which we didn't really talk about. Um, or, or for that matter, even why orange where it is and why white where it is. Uh, you know, was there some kind of thinking about it? Is it some kind of coding or was it, you know, secondary? Um, so I think like there is a lot that we could unpack in terms of your kind of architectural um, decisions that are almost, you know, secondary to the panopticum. Um, I have a big question about the swooping roof. Like what happens there? Like, is it, is it just like a water catcher or like why, why that curve? Like why aren't there, you know, like I would love to, like there's so many moves. Uh, so, uh, which you didn't really go into. Um, and I know, I'm sure that I hope that you spent, you know, time thinking about it and had iterated on it. Um, but I think even just thinking about it, then the presentation of your thesis project, right? And thinking about the kind of typology of a hospital uh, would be a little bit more interesting way to to present it um, and compare it, you know, compare it to somehow a kind of lineage of hospitals or, or typologies that that you've looked at and you kind of understood and you are you are building off of. Uh, because I do think this is relatively unique and the siting especially uh, uh, urbanistically is very unique. Um, so I would love to actually hear a little bit more about that. You know, um, if, I, I go on. Drake, I'm no, I didn't know whether they were he was going to address that or not. But if not, I have just a few comments to make. Oh, uh, object, uh, address. Um, you mean the the colors of the interior? Well, no, no, I, the, the comment that was just made. I'm sorry, I threw uh, you off. Well, uh. You know, in this case, I the, the there's really only two colors. Well, three if you count the glass, but the other two colors are white and brown. The brown is wood, and that those are the, you know, those are the sunken support spaces. So that's where all the offices and that kind of stuff goes. And uh, you know, I I made them that way so that they would stand out more in these images more than anything else. But I suppose they would stand out in real life too. Um, I have, if I could, uh, you mentioned the. Um, the, um, the work on the outside, that is the lattice and like uh, being able to see it. And if I could replay part of the video, um, I think you might be able to see how the bottom levels of the, of the lattice are transparent. And so you can see the grid through them. And it's only at this level where they become terraces and they're much smaller. So the cars get to see you know, they don't get, they don't get to see, you know, their, their view of the top of the building in that area would be blocked by the opaque terraces, but they get to see all the sort of um, the grid work here within this lattice, which is, uh, you know, you can see how it's sort of empty. So, I mean, I did consider um, 
that aspect of the project for the for the lucky drivers to be driving through. And it's also worth considering that the public space is also, you know, the sidewalks that are around the building and the, you know, the community gets to see it from the streets and the commuters that are passing through see it from the highway. And that, you know, the, the panoptic philosophy works on the outside as well because of the glass facade. There's, you know, it's, it's a very translucent facade. So, so the whole hospital is on display to the community but in can, the same uh, way that like the Reichstag is sort of on display. Eli, can I, I, sorry to interrupt, but, but yeah. I, I feel like you're making a, maybe you mean this, but in my opinion, you're making a, a kind of a strategic error in describing your goals, uh, but they're your goals. So why should I say that? Um, I feel like what you're doing is deconstructing the Panopticon. And, but, uh, but I agree with uh, uh, Miroslava that, uh, you know, you, I might not start there. It, I want to throw out a quick idea and then I'll retreat. I'm sorry. Uh, it, your project is, there's a centripetal and centrifugal quality to the project um, among other things. And you, you th while you were speaking, I kept remembering when I was your age, I was reading De Steel constantly. And in particular, the De Steel Manifesto, Theo van Dosberg, it was the basis of my thesis as a student at Berkeley with Stanley Sedowitz, Lars Lehrer. But in, the, in Theo van Dosberg's writing, he says the new architecture will be more or less centrifugal in nature with the masses or volumes freely floating about something. But he doesn't use the word centripetal. And there is no such thing as a centrifugal force. It's the inertia of an object should you let go of the centripetal force. But I bring that up because when I read that as a young person, I thought he's misusing the physics pur purposely. And I tried to figure out if there was evidence of that. But meaning you, you, you can't only have a centrifugal force. There's no such thing. So I feel like when you produce expansion and when you produce contraction and when you meditated on the Guggenheim and then when you cropped it, because of the city grid, you basically neutered the expansion and contraction and produced something that is, I think in a way, it's no longer expansive or contractive. It's eff effectively still with this kind of strange kind of metaphysics of turbulence going on around it, real turbulence from the cars. But I don't mean to overly read into it so much as to say that I don't think you're endorsing a panopticon, even if you're giving it to the right people. I, I think what you're doing is kind of spatially creating something that is neither or. The, the, the big question, you know, like when a cowboy, cowgirl has a lasso, when they let go, it just goes in a straight line. So if, if, if the internal force of your building was let go, you know, so I was gonna throw out one other thing. There's an engineer in mechanical engineering at Stanford, John DeBeery. Uh, MacArthur winner, uh, largely because he was looking at how schools of fish can surf each other's turbulence and use less energy to move. So they basically, they, you know, certain fish manage to manifest uh, energy from the energy of a different fish. But I was thinking like, if you now went into this and Mira's comments were helping me here, like if you began to optically analyze it, it seems to me when you give people a view, you give them a view, therefore it's not a bummer in your words, and the view is diagonally across, it hits a piece of glass, it continues to the next piece of glass, it's a little like a skipping stone, they can't quite find resolve. That, that's thrilling and perhaps anxiety ridden. And then on the other side, of, that's the inside view. On the outside, the automobiles and everything else would be producing a kind of turbulence and different problems of laminar or non-laminar flow that you might be able to imagine and model. Um, I do uh, want to say we only have a, a, a minute, a minute or two yeah, left. So if there's any can other I, can final, I, can I go real quick? Yeah, real quick I know, here, I know a great kind of comment. Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to be to the point here. Uh, just trying to give you some some pointers here, and in, in, in from from a future development of this project, healthcare uh, hospital design started off with the, the Florence Nightingale concept of a of a rectangular hospital. And then it kind of matured into a square. And then eventually somebody said, hey, let's make the hospital a circle. As if you have stars having circles. Then someone said, let's do a triangle. And then you have a triangle hospital. So you start experiencing all these different forms and shapes of hospitals. The key was how can you make them efficient? How can you make them function? Uh, so you begin to get in different shapes and things with, with, with hospitals. Um, 
I want to give you recommendations rather than say hospitals and prison. Try to go with hospitals and hotels. And that's another story, but for me, it's better. I, I can't stand the use of prison. And then things about hospitals that are very, very important is cleanability. Uh, and you had to look at how can you clean things? So it might look good, for, you know, from a visual perspective, but how can it be cleanable? Uh, and then wayfinding. You know, patients, one of the biggest fears a lot of times, when patients go to hospital, they're sick. They don't really care how things look. They're sick. They, if they're not sleeping, they're up under medication. But, but when people visit hospitals, they're more concerned about wayfinding. How can I get from point A to point B? So you have to be sensitive to those things. An all-white environment does not give one the sense of where they are. They will be lost for days. So you have to think in terms of wayfinding your way around. So I'm, I cut it real quick, but I tried to tr cover a lot of different points about healthcare and, and design. Well, thank you all. Unfortunately, we, we, we have to keep going, but I want to thank Eli. I did, I do, uh, uh, I use the same word, Andrew, I said brave uh, of him when he started the project. Uh, it's not, we don't get so many programmatically complex thesis projects at Zyark mm -hmm. and uh, I acknowledge it's been fantastic to have Drake on the review with your expertise. I think most of us are afraid of it as the building type because we have no idea how it works, right. but he really took it on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to commend him for it. Yeah. And uh, thank you for all the comments. Sure. Thank you, Eli. If you could okay. uh, unshare your screen, but hang out with us, please. We sure. might loop back at the end. Next, I want to introduce Bo and Lu and Yixing Zhang, who uh, uh, will present their project. Yeah. Hi, I'm Yixing, I'm Bowen. Our project is building a city CTS building and we will share our screen and also we will send the YouTube link to the chat. If we have some problems with the video, you can look at YouTube, yeah. This project investigates how the horizontal organizational structure of dense urban environments can be reoriented vertically within a mega structure that still preserves the diversity and the relationship of a specific city's built environment and urban culture. It is an exploration into how cities can develop in the future and is attempting to provide new, diversified and dynamic future models for vertical urban development and public spaces. Based on the fact that our cities are growing rapidly and becoming saturated, our project explores the potential of a new relationship between the building and the city. Using New York City as a site is an optimal place for this proposition with its dense existing context. Our site is the Grand Central Terminal and contains three blocks. The Grand Central Terminal is the transportation junction of Manhattan and also the start of the vertical city. In this project, the grid acts as a transportation system constructed by the city similar to the public subway system, yet containing vertical and horizontal systems which contain people and vehicle circulation. The messy and individual buildings are thought of as being developed by separate developers, accommodating the various program types. Each messy will be like a street building in a horizontal city with the same scale, same height, and same function. We extract from the existing facades of New York buildings to generate the facade of our Messi, which is combined with simple color to distinguish different programs. The three-dimensional grid creates a matrix for the building masses. A large connected public space runs vertically through the project. Major civic programs such as museums, libraries, hospitals, theaters, etc are distributed compositionally throughout the vertical city. Housing and office programs fill in the bulk of all other programs. The entry at the street level is connected to the Grand Central Terminal, a major entry point to the city, and a large public plaza is situated between the Grand Central Terminal and the Hampstead Hotel. 
The exploration of this relationship in our project is to create a large vertical set of buildings to contain all of the elements of a typical city. Top buildings increase the available living and working space, thereby reducing the intensity of density in some areas. In this vertical city, people live, work, go to school, and socialize as they do in horizontal cities, but in different manners having to do vertically. The project hopes to provide a platform for promoting the coexistence of multiple lifestyles, programs, spaces, and activities that have new relationships in the vertical skyscraper. That's it. Thank you. And we will share the loop video as our background. It's the same as uh, before. Yeah. It's, uh, you, made a, uh, you made a comment about the property being developed individually. Would you elaborate on that? Do you remember that comment? No. Uh, pardon, which one? One of your uh, insights and uh, comments, which I thought was correct and provocative was that the grid of the city mm -hmm. creates a grid of property and then individual owners develop that property. Yeah. Yeah, are you are you saying that that's a chaotic system, or can you elaborate more on? Um, so, we uh, the grid system will contain the vehicle and um, people circulation, and it will connect different programs together. And right. inside, people will have their own activities in the in the one uh, massing. Yeah. But in your insights about the existing city. You ha you made a comment that individuals each produce their own buildings. Is that uh, one of yeah. your, and is that a and you kind of demonstrated that that was ultimately a negative or effect or a source of something chaotic. Mm. Um, if I could jump in a little bit just to help, yeah. I, this has come up at the midterm, and I think. Uh, they answered it as saying uh, that, because um, of course the issue is, is this a single author or who you design all these buildings and it's it's done and that's it. And I, I think you guys have stated that there's a infrastructure, which is the grid. And then there's public space, which was that first figure after which it's more provisional where different developers, so this is a kind of civic project that then private industry could come in and buy into and, and you've tried to mimic what that might look like with the facades and things like that so is that right you guys yeah okay so if i gotta okay. so, so the idea here is that this is uh, uh, i'm looking at the scale of it and particularly as it relates how it's how it grows out of the rest of the city. Uh, but the idea here is that this is a kind of a self-contained city within itself. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 
I must confess, I'm I'm from the Midwest, brought up and raised in Chicago. I've been around tall buildings, but I think my first uh, stop was to New York. My conclusion was, how come they didn't stop? Uh, and this kind of goes in the opposite direction. It go it goes even more uh, per se. So, so I'm, I guess I'm curious in the way of I understand of trying to do everything in one spot, but um, it's just a scale up. But are you? But I guess you're saying that's the future. Yeah, but you know, you guys, uh, is it Bowen and Yixin? Is it Yixin? Yixin. Um, you know, I, it would be really helpful. And I, I always try, because these are thesis, right? This is your thesis project. It's not right. just a studio project. It is a thesis project. So at least for me, I would love to know a little bit more about, and that goes a little bit to, back to Michael's question that, you know, you spend so much time, I'm sure, like designing this thing, right? And thinking about the facades and how the pieces uh, stack uh, on top of each other and how people might actually connect between the different pieces. Uh, but my first question, again, would be, and it's a very simple question, but why do it? <laughs> like, why, why would you want to go vertically? Um, has anything changed um, in your thinking uh, based on our current situation and, and the pandemic? Um, has any of that affected your thinking in terms of, well, you know, we originally started like this, but now we are rethinking this strategy, right? And like just kind of understanding um, what, what your uh, kind of larger uh, premise here is. Uh, because this is, you know, like you've created basically a really beautiful mega structure, right? It's been done before. Uh, this is a kind of large architectural projects and many architects uh, have been, you know, thinking about and, and writing about it. Um, and so I would just love to understand a little bit more how you position yourself and your project, again, within a kind of larger you know, discipline of architecture. Do you, I mean, do, do you have any comment on that or any ideas? Like, like for example, like even the music, right? It was such a happy music. It, it was, was just, it's, yeah. it was yeah, so happy, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, I think, so I, I think you are genuine. I think like you, you would love to have, you know, you would love to see it built and you would love to kind of have it like being inhabited, right? So, but I would love for you to like state it that like, well, we think that actually density is still a really good thing, despite the pandemic, despite everything, like we really think that uh, building vertically is important because of uh, preservation of resources or w whatever, right? But at least somehow like state why it is important. Maybe you may even mention that, and again, like I, I always try to understand thesis projects in relationship to kind of larger, again, disciplinary lineage. But you can't, like, Rem Cool House, right? Like, it's been on my mind the whole time, but have you looked at, you know, Rem's writing and do you agree or disagree? Do you have a different, you know, strategy? Um, are you proposing something radically different from what has been thought of before in terms of megastructures, right? Does uh, nature and landscape play into any of this? Um, like there are so many questions, but I think you presented it as a, like, this is just this amazing, happy mega structure and everybody will basically live very happily on top of each other. Um, and so it would be just really interesting to hear a little bit more what, you know, what, what you're thinking in the background um, and how you, how you see this fit within a kind of larger, um, yeah, culture and, and world in, in general. Can you guys, could you start the video again? It kind of froze yeah. on a... And we will loop the... Sorry, video. no, but that, and then answer the question. Yeah. Um, so, um, so um, I will 
ask the uh, question one by one. So um, why we want to you uh, want to make a vertical city because uh, New York City is uh, growing rapidly and almost out of space. So we want to use the vertical space and to create a city like that, like this project. And um, also we collect the New York uh, existing um, facade and to generate our facade. And we want to extract the shape of the master plan of the New York and make a uh, extrude this into our messing and the grid will be the um, subway system of the New York and it will uh, it's not only the infrastructure but also have the circulation to connect people and vehicle si system yeah but, but you also have like all these happy shapes in there which go with the music yeah. like you have this music <laughs> and then there's like a strangely dystopic like you could have answered uh, Drake's observation. Well, we looked at New York and thought it wasn't nearly crazy and tall enough. <laughs> that was the problem with it. We thought we'd, we thought we'd fix it. In fact, that the, what they used to be the TWA building, isn't that right? The one behind it, is that what it used to be called? Like, Pan Am. A mm -hmm. oh, Pan Am, sorry. And one of those defunct airlines. And uh, there was that whole competition to do a big crazy thing on top of it. I remember the the... Wow, somebody uh, put Simon a Ungers up there. And, yeah. uh, Simon Ungers. Yeah. That was a PA award one of those yeah. years back when they those mattered. Well, I so think that, uh, that is a site right. for doing some big crazy. I mean, it's a it's going to be the size of your little swimming pool shape there, but still, um, you know that that uh, that pro uh, and, and even the the Philip Johnson the provocation at the top of a building is a kind of New York thing. And so, um, yeah, I think it maybe part of what we're, you're hearing is a question of how you're framing it. Yeah, I think um, the link that, that I give the link to New York is that uh, I remember the um, pamphlet number 11 on hybrid buildings, where uh, it explains and sort of, you know, kind of indexes uh, the different types of of uh, skyscrapers and how they are basically hybrids that have different programs that were usually on the ground, but now they're all consolidated on tower. And sometimes you could see the hybrid in, uh, you, you couldn't see the hybrid because they had just a full curtain wall. And sometimes you could on the exterior, you could tell which one's the hotel, which was the theater and which was the apartments. And so it kind of brings me back to that, that a history, but on steroids, on um, the sense that it now becomes pretty much uh, uh, you know, a, a continuation of that. And, and I think that for me is the strongest connection to New York, but I would definitely put this building somewhere else, um, maybe where there is a, uh, a trying of kind of economized land where you would say, let's, you know, let's stop expanding and let's build this, the city, you know, uh, higher as we, as we can. And, and, and definitely, you know, democratize the, the democratize the way uh, we build it. I mean, it, it, uh, I, I think it's a, for me, it's a great project. It, it reminds me of you know, the city where I come from, where it's uh, a, a bunch of, uh, uh, of parts that are sort of integrated, that are, have, have no coherence. And, and, and that uh, incoherence, I think, is what makes this project really interesting. And, it, and basically different from the, the first one that we saw, which was much about form. And I guess this is more about the shapes uh, rather than, than the forms and, and, and how they, they sort of tend to, they not necessarily hybridize, they, they seem to stack together. So there might be a much more hybridized, maybe it's in the program that it's more hybridized. But anyway, there's a lot of interesting conditions here that I would see that might um, be uh, probably uh, as successful or more in other kind of urban context around the world, maybe, you know, Mexico City or uh, some places like that. I have more of like an aesthetic question slash observation. I think um, besides sort of the different, like taking from the facades of New York, the, the vertical city you guys have made is really reading like more homogeneous than your like typical city like when i'm thinking of new york um you know 
I feel like it's super busy and like formally or like with the shapes you guys are using, it is super busy, but I think rendering it with like two or three colors, I think sort of takes away from the um, like contrasting features of all the parts you guys have sort of put together. Um, and I want to call attention to like some of these really, I mean, it's, sort of zoomed out now, but um, there are some moments where the video zooms in and we can get like labels or like logos from, you know, banks or companies and things like that. And I feel like that's also a feature that like, you know, there's like, I don't know if that's graffiti or something like that. I feel like maybe like adding more of those details to the project would sort of help make it feel more, um, a little bit more diverse or a little bit more like edgy like New York is like like I know everyone sort of commented on how happy all of this is and I feel like um you know New York is densely populated but it has a certain like grit to it that I feel like um is missing from this or most like densely populated cities have like a certain like edge that I'm not getting here You know, I will say though that um, I thought the presentation, at least for me, was was very interesting. Uh, we all agree that the music was very catchy. I, I almost found myself moving to the music. I tried to keep still so you guys wouldn't see me dance. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I, I also thought, you know, the whole idea of the, the freight car, the elevator going up with the music. I mean, I would never forget that. It was it was. And then how it brought you into the space, you know, whether you agree with it or not, it, it, it just kind of moved the eye alone. And the lines of the presentation I thought were very clean and crisp. Uh, and the way the city surrounds it. So I thought it was presented, you know, in a, in a very nice fashion, uh, per se. Uh, well thought out. I, I agree. I agree. I guess my comment is more about like the the representational decisions that were made, you know, in terms yeah. of like colors and yeah. Uh, yeah. just material choices, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I agree think with that's your a, comment too about New York. I agree with that too. Yeah. It's a good question. I think there was uh, some different versions of it over the summer, actually, not to. Um, there was a way happier version, like really poppy colors and mm -hmm. super, and, and that's when the um, Ferris wheel came in. And there was a question about, uh, and then it all of a sudden was like Coney Island. Everything was about mm -hmm. Coney Island, Coney Island. What is this? This is like Coney mm -hmm. Island in New York. Uh, so, so then it, uh, and then they were, uh, there's another version where all, all these facades actually are from <laughs> photographs. So they were mapped, right? They just image mapped them on. Right. So there was more kind of of the actual color of New York. Mm -hmm. And then they wanted to go the extra mile. So then they modeled all those openings yeah, and got rid of the nice. texture maps. But it was imperative that we get the scale right because it kept being red as every time you saw that grid, it looked like columns and beams. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they're not, those are tubes of <laughs> elevators and streets, right? Is that a because, helicopter because taking of the scale. off? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little helicopter. Uh, um, John, John, that helps yeah. for me to, you know, I, I'm gonna confess something here. Um, you, know, our, you know, we all know architecture schools go through periods and, you know, the, sometimes the, when I was young, I remember hearing a term, Le Corbusier was a form giver. And I don't know if people <laughs> would tolerate such a term these days, but I remember thinking, you know, that's, that's like birth of a, of a form and forms are not organic. So how does that happen? But I never forgot that because when, and I wanna come back around to your project because when the deconstructivist show, which you guys are too young to know other than through history, of course, when that opened in New York in 88, Mark Wigley, Philip Johnson, one of the points was that it largely borrowed forms and Bernard Schumi kind of deriving things from Russian constructivism, et cetera. But I bring all that up to say that I think your project is kind of squarely in this world of, of recycling existing forms. And what, however you kind of imagine the utility or importance of that, it could be a kind of euphoria, it could be Blade Runner, it, it could be all sorts of things if you started to render this with more weather and degradation of materials, et cetera. But 
the reason I really bring all that up is that in schools, you know, over five, six, and 10 years, different issues, not just in, in any school, issues take hold, post-structuralism, structuralism, you know, whatever we want to call it. Um, and in your case, I, I some, I'm starting to wonder if there's a kind of double project. One is a sort of, in not your generation, really, a kind of indexing of things, a la what Renee brought up, like, let's draw everything, and John telling us, like, let's take the photographs and then model them. And by doing that, you would, of course, learn a huge amount. You'd get all those forms kind of in your blood, in, in your mind. And so that's certainly valid and useful. Um, on the other hand, sometimes I wonder if it's a sort of um, end game. Uh, sorry to use a strange term, but maybe a kind of I can model anything in Rhino. And by God, I'm just going to model everything for three months and, and see what I come up with. In other words, it's almost like a euphoria of exhaustion. And uh, you might show that New York is not that heterogeneous or complex at all. Um, in fact, it does need more madness, et cetera. But uh, the reason where I was really going with that is you don't model structure, you're not modeling economy, you're not modeling energy, you're not modeling materials. And I'm not looking to short circuit your project, but it's a kind of exhaustion of form and a kind of whatever we want to call it, utopia, heterotopia. It, it's, it reminds me closer to Jimenez Lai, um, but I know a lot of people might come down this path these days. But I, I would argue that the most pivotal thing you said, in my opinion, that I completely agree with is that the, the original New York City with, with the commissioner's grid was, it's a mercantile project, divide up property, and create competition. The whole city becomes an auction. And developers can do whatever they want as long as it's within a certain set of parameters, which in the end are relatively restrictive. And every building touches the ground. So I feel like you're proposing something like a groundless world where property has a completely other ideally form of distribution. It's, it's a kind of anti-skyscraper in other words, you know, forgive me for sounding pretentious here, but you know, you're challenging property, you're challenging zoning, you're challenging privacy, you're challenging the idea that buildings relate to the earth. There's a term in physics that I like to come back to. Everybody, I, some people I work with constantly use it, first principles, you know, it's an old fashioned term. But after you do something, you try to break down what is the most primary thing you're saying and effectively begin again. So it seems to me you're challenging property and you're challenging humans relationship to the earth as the origin of property. I like your project, I mean, yeah. I, I, you, know, you, know, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, skyscrapers do that, but anyway, John, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't no, mean I, to say I know. I think the you're answer, right but, on. I think but, you're right on with it. I, I think, and then I, I would add to that and say, it's about public space ultimately. So I think the normative nature of the stuff of cities, however it's represented, you know, modeled yeah. or texture mapped or whatever, I think was a good move from the beginning actually, just to lop that off to say, okay, cities are made of a lot of generic things actually, uh, but. I think, and, and maybe they haven't completely addressed it, but that, what is the nature of a kind of public space in the sky of which I have to access laterally and vertically now? I go up to a public space or I go down to a public space uh, in, in that the, the, the sense of the ground plane in a traditional city and what is public is very clear and kind of binary, right? Between solid and void or, or maybe lobbies or semi-public spaces. So I think earlier in the day, uh, you know, this question of why came up, you know, so, okay, so why? And uh, both of you, I think, spend a little bit too much on a practical matter. Like the reason we do this is cities are too dense and therefore they're too dense. We have to do this. And uh, <laughs> that, that, I'm not sure that holds up so much that, that, that that's the reason I would think that, um, and look, I, love this project. I think it's done amazing things. I think this is super difficult. I mean, they're a team, but to try to mimic in a 
from a design standpoint and not a single author standpoint, how a city is kind of with its quirks and looseness. And of course we know they're designed over time and that's what city gives cities richness. They're actually embodying, if not decades, centuries uh, or more millennia at times of traces of, of, of humanity. So to, to try to enter that kind of as a design problem in any kind of urban problem, I think whether it's this case vertical or even a horizontal is always difficult, difficult for, for, for urbanists. Um, and so I think it was smart to do that. Although I agree with any of the comments about the representation uh, uh, and, and maybe uh, it's too architectural and diagrammatic right now in that sense, because it was stripped away from, from some of that, those other pieces. But, but what I think they need to, to answer or figure out for themselves or assess finally at the end of the day is the, what I think are the orange things, uh, the public pieces, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, how is that better than Central Park or Washington Square or, or other types of, of New York spaces? What is the characteristics of this and the huge amount of energy that would require it? Because the other things are just there. These are not challenging how, how a housing unit works or an office building. They've just assessed the kind of typical percentages that exist in a city and said, okay, well, let's let that bracket it. Are these, um, is, is this a kind of model of percentages of prevalence of things? Is that true? I would let them answer for that. Yeah. You guys, how did you decide on the percentages of office, housing, civic? Um, so uh, first we, uh, the public space is the most important space in our project. It will, uh, have, uh, uh, it will connect to uh, other parts of our building, like the civil program, uh, housing, residential, and it's also a connection to this part, uh, to this program. Yeah, and the housing and the rent, uh, office program, uh, almost uh forty percent of our project, and the other. Uh, civic programs will um, in this um, other space in between the housing and public space. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's a very smart way to do it. But two quick comments. Um, you know, under the Bloomberg administration and then Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, Dan Doctoroff, who later became CEO of Sidewalk Labs, you know, the city, like all cities, the role of GIS and the ability to quantitatively describe the city just exponentially increased. And, you know, Manhattan in particular is so geometrically describable. So uh, they really did kind of, they didn't really did instrumentalize the way they analyzed and projected development. But along with what John was bringing up, um, it's the, I, th I think the the question you this will be an arcane way to say something. Years ago, I remember Joan Ackman, you know, ran the Buell Center at Columbia. She was just a very, very influential voice at Columbia and in architectural thought. But she, in particular, Andrew or John, you probably follow this more than I did. Uh, she was teaching Siegfried Krakauer, and you don't need to remember the name, but. There was a point in that when one wants to secure a better future for a human, you might try to avoid the kind of the maelstrom of the spectacle, economics, development, exploitation of humans. The argument in Krakauer, I think fundamentally, is that you have to go through it. You have to go through the crisis, not around it. And I think there's something about your project where you're kind of optimistically wanting to declare that there's more of a future for public space in this kind of auctionary maelstrom rather than in a kind of retreat to, to fresh land somewhere. But I, I think, uh, Miroslava, you were the one I think asked about why early on. So, yeah, so I think John getting right back to that. It, you should, your music, we all noticed, the, the first piece of music to me sound, looked like somebody confidently driving a Range Rover to pick up their son, um, like an ad. <laughs> it, it had that kind of feeling of like, you know, I'm successful and I'm gonna go do something. and. You know, so I, the music is worth noting because it does begin to betray your sentiment and point of view. Like, so maybe that kind of silly confidence isn't what you're talking about. 
you might be talking about something more optimistic and also troubled. Um, but generationally speaking, all of us who teach here, aren't, aren't we seeing the kind of a, a rhino end game? It's like I can model everything. Um, <laughs> It's a well, I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, for, for, for these students now, it's becoming easier and easier. And I think, like, that's why I think it's a little bit more. Uh, oh, I like Turbo then, Squid. I would just download my project <laughs> if I was a student. It, it has kind of a video game also kind of aesthetic yes. to it. Yeah, and I was going to bring up, actually, I'm curious, uh, and I, John, I, I don't know if this was like a requirement on on your part or not, the, the previous project and this one too, like, so there are no plans or sections, like the kind of stereotypical plans or sections, uh, which I love, I would love to see, like, you know, that- <laughs> Oh, like, they had them, you... they had them, they showed them, but it went past so pretty quick. Oh, really? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I re okay, I remember too, okay, yes. But uh, so, but the more, perhaps interesting um, missing portion of this project for me is the in-between spaces. So if 40% is the office and the residential, you said, right? There is 60% left that is this in-between space, which presumably is mostly public, or at least that's how you, you said it, right? That the in-between space is the public space. And I would love to see more just views because all this entire animation is basically flying around this thing like a, a giant object, right? But you could, I mean, you have this incredible model. I think you can easily, after this, this, this is done, uh, do another animation where you're really actually flying through and into the space and actually looking at the city from what you designed. Because I think it will start to give you all of a different perspective on how, how you're, I think, conceptualizing it. Because in your mind, I think, in your mind, this is still a building. It's basically a kind of singular object. It's huge, but it's still a singular object. And I think it would be really interesting to just basically explore the tools that you already know so well. To Yeah, like here. And then I would love to just go more in and more in. And, and, you know, and fly through it, but you again, like step back and shift up. Because I think like, you know, animation is a great way to also not just explore something, but conceptualize something, you know, in, in an interesting way. Um, and so that's what I would encourage you to do as even for your portfolio or website or whatever, just basically have a series of other animations that allow us to actually inhabit this as a city, not as an object, but as a city. Um, you know, what does it look like when I'm in between, squeezed in between that circle, you know, and looking at the entire Manhattan? That's, that's amazing. That's a public space that you are not going to get on the ground. You know, that you are actually creating these kind of public spaces that are very unique. Uh, and so I would really, not the Ferris wheel, that, that is on the ground, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the kind of in-between spaces that really are, that, that is a different type of public space. And then I would start to think about materiality. I think that's like the kind of next fascinating step. Like, are there any trees? Is there grass? You know, is it all concrete? Like, I think it would be really interesting to think about what does it mean to inhabit the sky? Um, what, you know, is, is it the same as what it is on the ground? Or is, you know, do you have to think about wind? And somehow because, the, you know, there's so much wind <laughs> that you don't get on the ground, something different happens on the top. But the public space is a little bit different on the top. I think like, I love your project, I really do. I think like, I want you just to be a little bit more, um, kind of critical of what you also created and, and, and then explore it from a kind of unconventional way. Because I think you're still really kind of approaching it as a building. And so like a singular building that you're looking at it from the outside. But I think you've created a ton of super interesting spaces in between and conditions of the city that do not exist, you know, in, in typical streets of New York. So um, I would really encourage you, like, if you if you have time after this to to, you know, <laughs> take a few weeks and just really uh, push it a little bit further. I want to just final, uh, shortly say that I think um, 
this building requires as, as a thesis um, a, a, a um, show us how politically it's able to be uh, to be built, to be constructed as an idea and as a building. Uh, because I think once you have this, that it means that you already sort of uh, change, there was a paradigm shift on how we build cities. And so I was wondering, you know, that would be interesting to know, you know, what what is um, uh, what is different now if I'm living here? Uh, what, what, what are the politics of this high rise? You know, not in a Ballardian way where it might go haywire, but in, in a happy way, like the music. I mean, it's almost celebrating uh, kind of a new autonomy or, or a new sovereignty about how we build these things and therefore are able to do this. So uh, um, by encroaching on property and uh, air rights, et cetera, et cetera. So that could be the, you know, uh, part of the idea. I just um, posted in the chat, uh, Microsoft used machine learning to try to read aerial photographs and get a footprint of every building in the United States, which yeah. the, New York, the New York Times then played with. But the larger picture is just the degree to which it becomes more and more possible to quantify and, and work with things at immense scale. Um, and I think maybe when, when that starts to happen, whether it's you know um, Facebook over 10 years getting 6 billion users or et cetera, it, uh, does architecture and development start to slip into being more quantitatively described at scale? And when that happens, do different players begin to intercede and take ownership of it because it can be described uh, in new ways? So uh, maybe your next project is to draw every building in the world. <laughs> And begin to imagine, and begin to see, then begin to see China as small, uh, mm -hmm. and to instead see every. I think David Benjamin lately he's been saying thirteen thousand buildings a day are constructed on planet Earth. I don't know where he got that number, but I assume it's from his uh, relationship to Autodesk. But um, or listen, do you know Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn? His his uh, podcast is as uh, was it called Masters of Scale, but it's solely focusing on businesses that scale at rates that buildings that businesses never did. So in other words, I, I'm kind of overarchingly wondering, is this an architectural project that you get deeper into, or is this an indication of a frame of mind about quantity, data, scale, and disrupting ownerships regimes that have been in place since the Dutch were kind of uh, co colonializing places? Um, that's to, to me, maybe the old arguments about public space are not sufficient to the scalar questions. And didn't ArcG, ArcGIS and um, who's, who's ArcGIS owned by? The, it's the landscape architect who founded ArcGIS. Hmm. Um, I'm forgetting his name, but it started out as an attempt to basically model natural systems so that they could be right. environmentally protected it evolves into mapping everything. And then it of course ends up might as well be Goldman Sachs instead of environmental practice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once things can be described, they can be, they can be bartered. It's an interesting, interesting project, but um, is that uh, you guys are working digitally. So we're not, you're not doing 3d prints of it. Uh, there's no model like of the Dagwood, right? There was an early model, I think, okay. you know, that they had yeah. at one point. Yeah, we were a little model. Uh, no, I'm not from, this year. No, no I, we are too. We yeah. always, Columbia okay. always is, um, frankly. It's a, yeah. I liked the yeah. Coney Island comment as well because then you get into color and and uh, a whole different type of uh, you know. It's all of that is there. Yeah. Well, great. If there aren't any other uh, comments, we were going to take a five minute break. Uh, Bowen and Eugene, thank you very much. It's an exceptionally um, amazing project. It was really great working with you guys all summer. Uh, and congratulations for thank finishing. Um, we're going to take five minutes. Okay. And we okay. will, six minutes actually, we'll start right on the dot at 3.50. Uh, 
with uh, Zoe Malecki. He'll be next. And then we just, we just have three, uh, more to go. three more to go. That's right. <laughs> so we'll see you in five minutes. I'll keep this on.
So Andrew said uh, that I should spotlight your video. Tell, tell me when you want me to do that in your presentation. Okay, uh, that's at the very beginning. Okay, great. Yeah, because I'm going to talk for a moment without uh, the screen okay. share going, and then I'll switch it on. Okay. So you get you let. Me, I guess I have to do that here though, right? Like I yeah, do. I think so. I know, I see it in the three dots thing. Spotlight video. Pocket square, Andrew. I've never done one before. <laughs> You're upping your game, man. Yeah, it's gonna make me and Priyanka feel very special compared to everyone else in our group. <laughs> huh? Okay. I, was, I just looked, I just I was just looking online. Right. There was like nine different ways of folding it. This was, this <laughs> one's we called, had a five minute break. This one's called the Cagney. <laughs> So Renee, are you, go, are you going back and forth from Tijuana or are you just staying in Norman right now? No, I'm staying in Norman. Yeah, don't travel, don't get on planes too much, jeez. No, no, I've, I've been put, I've been staying here. Um, I got back in um, mid-August, so I probably won't go back to Tijuana until December. Ouch. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so house arrest. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> how are your How are your children, Renee? <laughs> well, the girls, you know, they are already one already finished college, the other one is in college, so yeah. Monica and I are Kind of on our on our own. <laughs> and, and Monica's not running Esperanza any longer. Is that now true? she went back to working for a firm. So um, Esperanza was. But we're still we're still so. part of the board. In in Tijuana or or. Uh, Monica's San working in San Diego. San Diego. But the foundation is in uh, Tijuana. Yeah. Yeah. Renee and uh, Monica gave my students a tour of Esperanza's work about two years ago. That was yeah. really, that was an amazing that was an amazing day. Yeah. We're gonna start. Uh, 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 I want to introduce Zoe Nowetsky, and she will take us for the next uh, project. And Zoe, let me know when you want me to do the uh, spotlight video. You can start that now. And thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly, John. That's such a pleasant surprise. Well, got a little text during the break. <laughs> so, uh, a well-dressed gentleman. For a little birdie named Andrew. <laughs> I'm going to tell Tom Wiscombe so he gets it right tomorrow. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, as John just said, hi, everyone. My name is Zoe. And the title of my thesis is Tremulous. Um, I'm working on a renovation of the Los Angeles Metropolitan Courthouse, and my thesis comes out of an observation in the architecture discipline of buildings where they produce a discrepancy between the solid object of the building and the atmospheric effect of the surface that clads it. Um, so I'm first going to show you just a couple examples of what I mean when I talk about this discrepancy. So the first is Herzog and Demeron's Ricola factory, which does this through uh, transparency and tiling. Chicago Architecture's proposal for the Visual and Performing Arts Center at UIC in Chicago. And SOM's Beinecke Library, which does this from the interior. Um, so this as I was looking into this, it felt like a fertile territory and where I could um, add to the discipline with my project. And this all came out of seeing this building on my commute to Sciarc and driving on the 10 East freeway in the mid to late afternoon. This William Pereira tower was shimmering on the horizon. So 
bear with me. I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right. So, um, and now, John, you can stop spotlighting my video so you can okay. share. So um, in the top right corner is William Pereira's USC Tower, which was built in 1965. And across from the 10 freeway, almost mirrored, is the Los Angeles Metropolitan Courthouse, which was designed by William Allen in 1972. So not only were both projects done by men named William, but um, with them being across the 10 freeway from each other, the Pereira on the left and the Los Angeles Metropolitan Courthouse on the right, they echo each other. And it was a, became an opportunity to create a dialogue between these two buildings. The Pereira where it has this uh, latent shimmering effect that's part of uh, the tectonics and uh, maybe is even unintentional. And then uh, my project where the shimmering effect is very intentional and in trying to really amplify it. So this is a photo of the Los Angeles Metropolitan Courthouse two years after it was built in 1974. And this is the courthouse today. Uh, this is where people go for cases involving traffic violations to pay traffic fines, for cases involving mental health issues and misdemeanor crimes. This is where, um, except for when Paris Hilton has her DUI and the court case is handled here, it's mostly everyday people who are coming here. Um, and this is the site on Hill and Olive Street between Washington and 21st. The um, lines for this building usually wrap around, um, wrap around the whole building. And as you can see, the, the little markers for the six feet distance as it's reopening uh, go all the way around the building. Uh, often one, only one side gets shade at a time. So depending on how the line's going and what time of day, people are often standing in the sun. It has a two star on Yelp and really horrible reviews. People just do not like this building at all. There's also hardly any windows. This is the motor vehicle inspection building, which is also on the site. And um, it's a home for pigeons. In November, the Judicial Council of California slated this building for a critical need level renovation. And money was set aside to rebuild and renovate 86 courthouses in California. Uh, however, in May, the budget was reallocated because of COVID-19 and all of these projects uh, were put on hold. So uh, for, since it was postponed, it's a great opportunity for me to do a very different renovation than what they were planning. Um, so my, what I'll be doing is, um, the diagram on the left shows the current circulation of the building. Although there are entrances on both sides, you're only allowed to use one and people often have to wrap up in a line around the building. Uh, what I'm proposing is eliminate entrances at the bottom. You just take the elevator straight up to the top and you enter um, in a large, enter into this large garden oasis space. So um, my renovation is doing three things. On the interior of the building, it's um, creating an intimate reading of this tremulous effect. It's creating this lovely space to wait for jury duty or to pay your traffic tickets. Um, and it's also an ecological preserve for birds. Uh, then at the street level and the skyline, taking what's currently a gray pigeon of a building and turning it into this uh, beautiful, colorful, heirloom fancy pigeon. Um, so these, these, this pigeon has kind of become a little bit of a mascot for my project. Uh, they're specially bred and they compete in these fancy pigeon competitions. Um, and so, so for my project, I'm, I'm putting a large hat on the top of the building. I'm doubling uh, the height of the current structure. And I'm um, hemming the skirt or kind of pulling up the feathers and the plumage so you can see uh, little feet of the, of the core and the stairwells for the building. 
Uh, these are some early massing models of the hat. And then as it turns out, when I was looking at uh, old pictures of this use, the Pereira building used to be called the Occidental Center, it's now the USC Tower. Uh, there's actually a rooftop garden at the top. And this was, uh, since it was the second tallest building in Los Angeles, they thought at the time this would be a, a nice space for people who don't work in the two tall towers to get to see and experience the city. Since then, the uh, rooftop garden has been enclosed, uh, enclosed with glass and it has now become interior uh, inside functional space. So um, bring this image back again on the left is the Pereira and then on the right is the how tall the courthouse will be uh, once the hat is added on. So again, in doubling the height and adding this hat, um, it's now visible from the skyline and the tremulous effect becomes an urban feature in the city. It's visible from the street. And then um, you get to experience the effect also from within and I'll show that shortly. Um, the experience of this building is akin to Surratt's Ascendant on Le Grand Jatte and how, how that painting is experienced. Um, you experience the abstraction of the color through your physical movement. So there's um, how you perceive the painting when you're far away in the gallery, when you're at a medium distance, and then how you perceive it when you get close. So the facade of the courthouse of so the hat on top is made up of all these tr little triangle flaps. I'm calling them little, but they're actually uh, five feet wide. And uh, these are some early animation studies made during the summer of these triangular flaps. The flaps have since become little tetrahedrons. And um, this allows me to orchestrate how the effect is perceived in the city. So when you're looking at it from one angle, it might appear completely solid. When you look at it straight on, it's about 50% open, 50% closed. And then from the other angle, you're able to start seeing the other side, the interior of the flaps, and you can see the other color. Uh, these are little mock-ups of um, how the big model behind me was put together. And then um, photographs of the same model behind me. It's, it's viewed from, from one side, straight on, and then from the other side. This is the uh, building with my renovation on the site. This is the ground floor where you uh, enter into the core. And then you take the elevator up, get out on the ninth floor of the uh, concrete structure, which is currently all mechanical space. And then you move up a ramp into the large eight story tall garden oasis area. And this is what it would look like as you're exiting the elevator and starting to ascend the ramp. And um, just for a point of reference, this is approximately the size of the Getty Villa Garden, so it's quite large. This is a section of the project, and the sectional diagram of it is this uh, solid concrete regular floors of the bottom half, and then the top half, which is the same height, is just um, big and large and empty, air flowing, lots of light. Um, courthouse does not have a lot of windows right now, so it's really quite dark and dingy in there. And uh, this is how um, it would look close up of the interior from above, so a pigeon's eye view, if you will. This is um, a 132nd massing model. And then this animation here shows how, um, kind of illustrates how you would see it differently um, as you're um, kind of 
driving by it on the freeway and as the freeway curves or as you come back in the other direction. So um, not only is this building, um, does this building kind of have this autonomous effect where it um, changes as the viewer's position changes and their perception changes. But there's also, um, also some of the flaps are mechanized, kind of like a Scolari board or a split flap board in um, train stations where it uh, flaps to change um, the time or the location of the train. And before I show you a video of how that looks on the building, I just wanna take it back to Surat one more time uh, when I was building this model behind me, I was so close to it that I couldn't uh, really see what color it was, the whole thing was looking like, or even the progress that it was making. So I kept having to step back and take photos of it um, just to be able to kind of mimic this distance and see what it would look like from far away. And so this is a stop motion animation of the flaps opening and closing. Um, and as they open, you see the underside, which is white. And as the, uh, the white appears against the, the colored background, it makes this um, tremulous shimmering effect. So thank you very much. And I'm now going to copy um, a Miro link into the chat. So if you'd like to look at any images, um, they're all up there as well as the videos. And um, I was thinking I would just keep it all of us looking at each other at first, but if you want, I'm happy to screen share the Miro board um, if you'd like. A, a question the the last animation you showed is that was that was that composed or was was that how did the animation work on that it, it was it uh, it was done with this physical model so um, behind you yeah, <laughs> yeah so I built it and I put it on the wall and um, some of the I have a little example here some of the flaps are these little um, mm -hmm. pieces which are scored so then um, just went in and uh, would close them and then open them back up again. So the animation is just still shots that you then put in sequence. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. okay, that's, that's, that's what I was wondering. So, so I remember seeing your, your prog project at midterm and I just want to like make a statement, commend you for like the progress you've made in terms of the representation of the project. I think the way um, the renderings and the animations that um, you've put together really give that like mass, that lightness that it was missing before. Um, and, you know, now being able to like visualize what the garden looks like on the interior, I think is fantastic. Oh, thank you so much, Nachu. And that's actually, I was really thrilled to see that you would be on this review and that you'd get to see my progress with it. So thank you so much. Yeah, I have to say, I, uh, I, uh, I love your project. <laughs> I, uh, there, is, uh, um, there is a certain kind of constraint in, in how you, I think, approach thesis, which I think was actually really good meaning that you really just uh, pick something that is very clear as an agenda to mm -hmm. me. Uh, and therefore, I think I can kind of dive into all the steps that you've so thoughtfully and like really clearly articulated. So I just want to first commend you also just very, very clear presentation. I really appreciated that. Um, just again, from the kind of initial intent to the process to the final kind of effect of what you're after. Um, I, I, I'm just looking at the mirror board as I'm talking so I can reference different things, but um, I, I want to first start with, uh, and I, I hate when, the, when I was a student, I hated when critics did it to me and now I'm here I am doing it to you, but <laughs> there is this one study model uh, with a purple background 
-hmm. where um, the same top basically covered the bottom portion of it. Yeah. Yes. So I am really intrigued by this model and I'm curious and I don't, I cannot quite yet decide, you know, which, which one is better, but um, I am curious why you, you know, left this behind and really wanted to differentiate the top from the bottom as two separate entities, which clearly, right, that, that's how they read at the very end. Yeah. Um, so I can you maybe just like briefly mention why, um, you know, this was abandoned. Yeah, um, so I kind of, I was thinking of this one like the, uh, an oversized lampshade that covered the whole thing. And um, I kind of felt like, I know a lot of people don't like this courthouse building, but I kind of really like it. And I drive by it a lot. And every time I'm just um, a little bit in awe of it. I think part of that is because um, it's such a large site and there's one big eight story building on it, but there, everything else on the site is very um, low or there's nothing else. Um, so like part of it for me was just to pay a little bit of respect to the original courthouse. Mm -hmm. And also it kind of, um, I don't know if this is the right word, but it felt a little like disingenuous or maybe too easy to just um, say, let's just cover this up and not see it anymore. Okay. And then, no, I, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh, and then also um, just kind of, I, I like the, the dichotomy of it and um, of the uh, solid and concrete versus the light and the airy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, that makes more sense to me now because I think I'm looking at the model in comparison to your two exterior perspectives, which are also like really gorgeous. Um, they're, you know, on the bottom left, or yeah, right there. Um, and uh, I think there is something, what I, the addition of this kind of strange top really somehow destabilizes the building without really doing anything to the original, right? So where the original model, as you mentioned, kind of covered it up and hid it, you know, and gave it new identity, this one still uh, keeps it as it is, but because the top or the hat um, is angled, is shifted, right? It truly destabilizes what is also below. So it's not just the top, but also by, by the position of the top on, on the kind of stable bottom, uh, it destabilizes the entire structure. And so I think like that, that is really amazingly successful. Um, I have, um, and you know, to, to Michael's first questioning of the, the video, like I think that was just truly amazing way of working through kind of like analog and digital and uh, how you were able to kind of put it together in a, a really kind of poetic almost presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about the color here. So on these two images, uh, you didn't really mention it. Why articulate the edges of this cube blue? and then keep the you know the well, in between paints yeah yeah um so that was in an effort to um kind of give the illusion of softening the edges but there's also pulling hmm. the cube out of um, the Surat painting which uh right along the edge of it before the frame is uh, like a painted frame which is a little bit darker um so yeah that that was the idea behind the, hmm. the edges I wonder if you could feather it more because yeah. right now it almost reinforces the edge for me at least visually yeah. like it actually really makes it more prominent than I think if it was just one singular color or I would really stretch the gradient right so if you do want to have the kind of blue at the edge but I would like probably triple or quadruple the width of that blue you know onto the interior because I think Right now, you more articulated them rather than, you know, uh, feathered yeah. them, um, just visually. But I think, I, I understand, I think, um, uh, what, what you're after, especially against the blue background. I think if you were able to, in these two renderings or these two collages, uh, approximate the blue on the building a little bit closer even to the blue of the sky, I think it would start to really kind of dissolve visually that edge, right? 
Um, and potentially, and I know mirrors are always, you know, it's like when, whenever I see mirrors in any architectural project, I'm like, oh, you know, but for you, I'm wondering if, uh, <laughs> if potentially, you know, some of these little panels along the edges, again, somehow have a mirror facet incorporated into, into them. So they start to kind of reflect the environment around and truly dissolve visually. Um, I think like you've kind of developed this, I mean, relatively simple but sophisticated facade system that you could even push further now, uh, oh, yeah. that you know kind of how it works, but really kind of looking at the substructure on the inside. So I have to say like the one thing I would really uh, work a little bit more on is the interior view. Mm. Because I think the interior of this beautiful garden space, uh, I think it could be much, I think it would be much more kind of ephemeral and ethereal than what you have. Mm -hmm. Right now it's quite flat, but I think the light shining through and the movement of the leaves and everything, I think would be a little bit more atmospheric. Mm -hmm. And I think what you were after, at the very first sentence I wrote down, right, was atmospheric effect. Mm -hmm. So I would really, really try to push those yeah, one, two, three images uh, to the next level. <laughs> you know, really think about atmosphere and really think about changing of, you know, the environment around and how this garden would actually change with the environment. So I think uh, it could be truly quite, I mean, magical. Yeah. It, it, it really could be a magical place, you know, where, and then people, you know, go and get their ticket or whatever they need to do. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I would really push this representation uh, a little bit further. Okay. And actually, um, it's funny that you, you mentioned um, feathering it a little bit more because actually, um, this model I was working on a little later than the renderings and it uh, kind of had that in mind and I tried to feather it a little bit more. So um, it's funny that you- Yeah, it. you can see it even behind you. I can see that the edges have a little bit more gradient incorporated yeah. into them, yeah. So, so I have a question. There's one of these, I, there's a rendering and then a photo of the model where you have these little like feet underneath the, the original building and I'm wondering, is that like an intended intervention or is that already existing underneath the, the is that part of the structure? Yeah, that's an, um, that is both existing and it's an intervention. Um, so these are the locations of the um, core. So the center is where the elevator core is and then uh, the stairwells are on the um, four corners of the building and that does exist already. However, um, it's actually an enclosed space on the first floor. And so I'm um, imagining just cutting away the, the building and the concrete there and leaving these feet um, so that you can go into the elevator and come all the way up to the top. Okay, so. So the building is not slanted, the original building, right? It's- um, No, the original building, <laughs> it's not. It has a very straight top. <laughs> right. So the structure would have to the new the new um, the new hat would have to kind of um, uh, do that bowing by mm -hmm. by itself, correct? Because um, so you would have to figure out how to how to do that. But um, I find it that it's very I like it because it's very clear. The, the project is just very clear what your intention is, and and then your uh, the way you sort of perform all your uh, experiments are also very clear toward the goal that you want. So I really commend you about that. And, and I agree with Miroslava about the uh, atmospheric mm -hmm. effects uh, in the interior, because I think you did a great study on porosity, but I, I, I was, I'm, I'm thinking that you would get a, uh, you know, a, a very varied and, and, and fabulous sort of, uh, colorful um, uh, light in inside that space mm -hmm. and 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 not only that but also the the, the shadowing uh, would be really interesting to see mm -hmm. I, I think uh, it's, it's shown very lightly and I think it would be in in real in real life it would be much stronger so mm -hmm. 
that that phenomenological quality of that interior, I think, needs to be pushed up uh, a little bit more because I think it, it it will once the the light hits it in the morning or hits it in the mm. you know in the evening uh, and 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 so I think it, it all it, it can now do the garden in some way or another. I think eventually you can have a space there that it's all about its architectural effects. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, yeah, I think it has a lot of potential as a as as an interior as, as well as as having this sort of dialogue uh, in the exterior with the other building. Mm -hmm. I, it's, uh, I I second everybody's positive comments. It's it's the it, and I think the questions asked have been very enlightening and helpful. Um, I have a broad comment first, really, and I can be quick, but. You know, at, at some point, uh, you know, forgive the narrative, uh, depending on when you entered architecture school, and if, if, you're, if you're a little older, um, there was a, something called a client, and then there was an owner. But mm -hmm. somewhere in the 80s, we got a post-structuralist subject. Uh, we got a person who is defined more by relationships to power and to techno technology and they're less of an less they're not necessarily a citizen nor are they an owner nor are they a kind of occupant or user there there's something else and i bring that up because when you once we began to see the person who's using a building or designing a building for that matter in a more complex set of you know structures it becomes it it architecture certainly gets richer and it can acknowledge a far finer grain of people and needs etc but it also starts to become, I think, a matter of where you begin to try to conditionally say, if I did X or Y, I might cause X or Y. Mm -hmm. So um, if I make the counter three feet tall, it might work for an adult, it won't work for a child. That's maybe you know early in the century. Later on, we begin to wonder like, why is it a counter at all? But I bring all that up to say that you have a courthouse, which is a, you know, a super socio-political project so, and people are not that excited to go to the courthouse. Either they have a problem with their taxes or they're dealing with some sort of other question. On the other hand, you have an, for lack of a better phrase, a kind of optical effect and uh, the word feathering was used, et cetera. So that which was an object becomes less of an object. It becomes more of a phenomena. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what, the reason I make that long preamble is you as a designer, I think, are, are, I found you very refreshing in a kind of obvious way because you're not necessarily modeling this digitally. You're making a cardboard model and you're trying to actually see the effect with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. And then you, when you make an animation, it's a handmade animation. So I think as a designer, you, you, know, you are maintaining, for better or worse, some sort of one-to-one -one reciprocity with the thing you're designing. You're trying to. Mm -hmm. But then when it becomes a large public building, now it's for, I'm thinking of it as the Roland Barth essay on the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, from 40 years old that the mm -hmm. Eiffel Tower is simultaneously being viewed by millions of people who are alone. They, they're not viewing it. They're not viewing it in a way that they're aware of each other, but they are in fact, you know, Roland Barth. So I bring all that up to say that I think the more uh, going forward, I think the more you can stay in that kind of one-to-one -one reciprocity mm -hmm. and then probe how that reciprocity that you have with the object becomes coincident with or projective with the relationship others would have, other subjects. Mm -hmm. Because my feeling about schools in the last you know, 10, 20 years, really 25, is you know, we frequently need to and must address big social questions mm -hmm. at the same time we are bumping into this wall where we as the designer are often very singular in our own motivations and techniques. So it's, it's how you probe that relationship. So a, a simpler way of saying it would be, is it possible that you would experiment optically, whatever you choose to call it, go as far as you can, and then ask yourself in a kind of, forgive the analogy, with a cold shower, Mm -hmm. Does this in fact mean anything to anybody else who sees it? Mm. You know, it's still going to be a courthouse. It's still where they take your taxes. It's still where they process your misdemeanor. Um, in other words, you haven't really removed the courthouse. Um, and I know you know that. And I'm not asking you to. The, the last thing I would say really briefly, I mean, I, I used to do a lot. I still do a lot of work around housing. I've had a lot of 
friends from the autonomous side of architecture criticized me for it, saying I've become an economist. On the other hand, if you don't become an economist or a kind of sociological player in courts or anything else, then are you, are you really in the world? I think you're asking that kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the final thing I would say is um, you're in a kind of realm of art and architecture, of course, you know, and I think you're in a realm with, um, you know, Robert Mangold and Joseph Albers and some, you know, 50 year strain of art where art starts out almost like a form of optical engineering and then moves past that. That's where I think the questions about the painting of the frame, you know, this is a mechanical instrument. And if I, I think it was Miroslav was asking, Mir, was asking about if it was painted more like the sky. But um, the, the final thing, when you cut the roof of the existing building, can we look at that from the outside? Um, I was thinking, I, I, it basically induces a quality of sliding. The, the, the new building, the new structure is not only leaning, but it would tend to want to slide off. Mm -hmm. So all of the, I think that's where when you cut the foundation out from under the building and put the pink squares underneath it, mm -hmm. I think you're in some realm of Carl Andre and Robert Morris and mm -hmm. Michael Heitzer. You've, you've, you're playing with physics there. So there's a quality of weight and then, you know, you know, which is gravity, it's a vectoral component in the hardcore sense of the word physics. And then the optical part is light waves. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, there's the gravitational waves, there's the light waves. This project is, is, is super scientific at some level. Mm -hmm. I think in physics, the forces are divided between, um, what are the terms, uh, scalar and vectoral. Vectoral forces always have the same direction. Gravity is one, they go to the earth. Uh, scalar quantities and forces actually vary. They don't have a universal dimension. So temperature is a scalar quality. Mm -hmm. And uh, light is something in between. Light is optical for the eye and it's also thermodynamic in its heat, it's electromagnetic. So maybe this project is really some sort of physics of electromagnetism, weight and other things. And if you went further into it, you might then say, can we begin to talk about a larger aggregate social experience mm -hmm. that what we normatively call art, but is in fact more of a project of physics, weight, light waves. And then you're in some, I, t I sometimes think of design as method acting. Like you, you start off doing something, but that's just the beginning of becoming somebody who you aren't. So, you know, and somebody like Joseph Albers and Robert Mangold and all of, you know, Mondrian for that matter, that was a kind of art of light waves. Uh, it all is. Um, but I think, I think the physics part of this thing leaning is, is, I was thinking of when you put a laptop on a neoprene stand and it just, it doesn't slide off. Um, like, or if you had bricks that were canted, you'd have to have a different type of mortar because they would want to slide. Um, I, I, you, could, you should put this thing into FEA and look at how that whole box is trying to slide. I, I, think, it, I, think, it's, I think it's a, I think your tactility and the way you worked one-on-one -on -one and maybe COVID forcing you to work in isolation like this, um, it, it had a good effect on your project, I think, yeah. Well, thank you for all of your comments and feedback, Michael. Um, I just, yeah. as we have just a couple more minutes, I want to just- yeah. I like to get some comments in there, make this, give oh, me yeah. time, give me time. Okay, yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, Michael, you gotta be shorter with your comments. Yeah, I will be. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I, this one in particular, yeah. yeah. It's my fault, I'm the moderator. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm gonna challenge you, Zoe. Um, Michael's, Michael, I think, touched on this, but I, I don't think he went far enough for me per se, but um, your building is, is, is in a certain area. Uh, to, to the west is Trade Tech College. It has buildings there. Actually, some of the buildings has brick with the brick falling off the facade in a very curtain-like manner. And then you have a fashion market, I believe is the other direction. So it's surrounded by some, some buildings of some icon types. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
you started off your, your conversation and I, I thought it was very sensitive in terms of you talked about the people. And I will confess, I'm a people person. I'm a cultural person. I think we all have to be sensitive to the surroundings. Mm -hmm. uh, the building is not an island. Uh, and I was really waiting and hoping you would address some of those issues in terms of the people on the street lining up. And this is a community of brown and black. I mean, it's, it's a cultural culture community. Uh, I don't think you addressed that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to not just design, but we have to design to, I think the surroundings and the areas and the culture. Uh, that site, uh, and I guess you didn't address the site per se, but as you know, the site around it is barren. Yeah. There's, just, there's nothing happening around that site, but, but, but you chose not to address that. I think your, your approach was to go up in the building and address it on top. Uh, and I can understand that. I, I'm not sure though, from a courthouse perspective with security being a very, very big issue, Mm -hmm. how that would happen, uh, not to say it's impossible to happen, but, but how it would happen, I, I don't know. Um, I think as, as I was listening and trying to get the feel for the hat, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I, I think maybe hat is defined different ways for different people, I guess, but for me, it would have been a little bit more supportive if the hat had a brim on it, if it had an eyebrow that defines it more as a hat, mm -hmm. particularly as a separation from the old and the new. Uh, I don't know if you took any surveys in terms of what the people thought of the, the existing building, but I know you said that you really like it. And I think sometimes we have to be sensitive to I might like something, but what do the people who use the building the most, what do, how do they feel about it? Um, so I guess my general feeling is, is being sensitive to more than just the I, but, but, but what about the we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and um, like I've spent time thinking about what I would do to the site and I feel like that's something um, like I'd love to do and kind of like a next step beyond uh, this thesis and doing it in school is to think about that as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, my, my hope is that, you know, down the line, um, so I was looking at the original plans for it and it seems like a lot of the um, site space was intended to be um, a garden from the beginning uh, or at least accessible and right now, um, there's these like large rocks in it that are too big to walk on, but too small to right. climb on. So it's just, um, yeah, it's really inaccessible right now. But there's a lot, but there's a lot of opportunity there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just for clarifications though, the, I know this, on one hand, this is for people who normally have to stand in line out in the sun so they can go up there instead when they're going to use the courthouse. Is that the only people that would use it? No, and I think I didn't mention this in the presentation. My hope would be that people in the community and families uh, could go up there too, because um, you know there's not a large green part. I mean, I don't live too far from this courthouse. There's not a large, huge green area in this part of town, and um, you know there's not a lot of shade. There's not a lot of trees here either. So um, I want this space to be something that is more accessible for people. Is it become a little bit like the Reichstag? in Berlin, where uh, you have this government building and there are serious government decisions being made, but at the same time, you have tourists, you know, uh, going up on the, uh, on the cupola. Uh, and, and so there is this kind of dialogue between the, 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 the sort of the state and, uh, and, 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 and the public, uh, even to a point that it becomes a kind of tourist attraction, uh, which is a kind of uh, very interesting combination because usually like Michael was saying, uh, courthouses, uh, 
tend to be you know highly secure security places. So it's that that uh, sort of uh, uh, way of looking at it. Uh, I, I think for me, it, and and uh, it, it's in, interesting and. And I find it possible. I mean, I, it reminds me also of Robert Irwin, the artist who he has done a lot of art in in courthouses. Uh, he has he he did a piece in the San Diego courthouse uh, designed by Richard Meyer, and so he's he's uh, I think these these uh, combinations of installation and uh, sort of these uh, architectures do do happen. So yeah. Irwin, that's a Renee, that's a very good example. I saw Irwin lecture about two years ago. Uh, he was at Stanford. Some donor had uh, given some major piece of his work to the university, and he was in a very flippant mood. He described yeah. that he would he had been commissioned by the GSA, the government uh, agency, to build an installation inside what later became the Trump Hotel in D.C. Wow. And he was describing that because the contract came from GSA. The Trump Organization, namely Ivanka, he said, couldn't interfere with his art, which he viewed as really important socially. Uh, you could debate that, of course. But yeah, Rene, that was exactly a moment when, I mean, because it's Robert Irwin, he has this kind of stature, he gets into these kind of situations. But you might be able to, you know, as, as though I would, years ago, maybe 10, 15, the MoMA, had MoMA New York had put on a major retrospective around the Bauhaus, mm. uh, which seems like an obvious thing to do, of course. But but Michael Hayes, a Harvard architecture history theory, had written about it, long extensive review of it in Art Forum. I could find it, or I'm sure you'll find it. But he was asking himself about the relevance of a kind of instrumental, highly codified form of art from suprematism through Mondrian and through somebody like Seurat the degree to which society still uh, had room for that. And Hayes was describing that street lights, red, green, blue, red, yellow, red, yellow, green, and the, the degree to which things are color coded in a 7-Eleven, that you know, the, the optical instrumental description of everything from barcodes to street signs had effectively in his mind exhausted a public from finding that therapeutic. Mm. Uh, so it was just, it was like a heavyweight history theory person who lived in that world and still does, I'm sure, asking himself, would the public ever find it again? So that's where like the Dagwood sandwich from Andrew's previous. Anyway, I, I think this is a really, this is really a thesis project. And uh, Drake, I agree with you about you know, you, you look closer at the context and people and what, what, do, what do people think communicates versus what do we think communicates? Uh, even down to the point of, does it have, have a broom or not? is a very interesting question. Um, so, but, yeah. Can I ask for any final short comments and we have to move on, but please, I don't want to cut anyone off. So it sounded like you actually wanted to uh, wrap up uh, this session before. <laughs> well, we were, uh, Zoe, Zoe did. Yeah, yeah Zoe, yeah, Zoe was actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. On time, John. <laughs> she was air traffic. She was air traffic. Was, you, little, you started. It was a little like Laurie Anderson was moving. A, moving we started you two minutes act. late, so which <laughs> I knew. So I, I was giving you extra time anyway. And of course, if the jurors want to keep talking, I will not, we, we can adjust. <laughs> No, I just okay. want. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say though, like just uh, the last two comments from Michael. Um, uh, thinking about the public art, um, I, I think we are also. I think you guys are like a different generation, right? Uh, and so I think like you, 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 you view the world differently than the generations before us. And I think like there is a certain. And the the previous project before you also was. There's a sense of optimism and a sense of uh, kind of, uh, and I mean it in the best possible way, innocence, which I think is actually something that I, I encourage you to, to not lose. And so, you know, the question of, you know, thinking about uh, people in the community, the, the fact is also there are people your age in the community and there are younger kids in the community, right? 
uh, that might view this very differently than somebody of you know a different generation. And so just basically thinking about, yeah, who, who is the audience, who is the viewer? But I think you yourself are one of the audiences and viewers. And so I think it's okay to also uh, approach it from a kind of personal point of view as just, otherwise I think, um, and understanding like what your personal point of view means for the larger you know, public audience for sure. Um, but I think like I, I would, I would hope that you learn some tips and tricks through your architectural education um, and, uh, and kind of discover means and methods through which you can actually communicate, right? Uh, larger ideas to, to a larger audience. I, and I think as an architect, we, we, we have things like form and aesthetics and texture and color, right? Through which you can actually communicate your ideas. So, I don't, I, I, I find your project actually really refreshing. Um, the question of the ground, and I, I, we didn't really talk about it, but um, this whole building actually would act on ground through reflection and through shadows. And I think it would actually activate the entire uh, surface around it more than you probably even thought of yet. Um, you know, even just simply taking uh, photographs of your model with really directional lighting would start to produce beautiful, probably effects on the ground itself without, you know, calling, without you thinking about, oh, I have to have a public park and I have to have benches and I have to have, you know, things that are kind of thought of typical for uh, potentially court, you know, courthouses around. But you almost created a device that can activate the ground without truly doing something physical on the ground itself. And I think that's something that we didn't really talk about. So that's something I would just encourage you to also like just document or play around as you are, you know, um, thinking about putting it in your portfolio or website or whatever. That like, I think like you actually did it, but you, we didn't really talk about it. Thank you. That's a, that's a, sorry, we do need to move on in fairness to other students though. So, um, but thank you, Zoe, and, and, and uh, congratulations. Great part. Congratulations. Next, we have Priyanka Rajani. Priyanka, hey. the, yes. the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Um, so my, pro my name is Priyanka Rajani, and my project is called Blink Blink. My project Blink Blink looks at designing an elementary and middle school in Chicago using a series of brink conditions, which is part of my formal investigation. The brink here is a perception of, is an indication of fragile perception. It is the moment where the intermediate and the mundane indicate moments of intrigue and interest. The neutrality of these intermediate spaces become the most dynamic as they resist settling into any categories. Hence the, the brink, which is a point of indifference or weakness, becomes a point of power or difference and has the power of eventuality. Let me share my screen now. Superimposition of axis and gridded spatial orders produce ambiguity of spatial organization. This creates a sense of depth by perception due to overlap. The flattening of these layers forms an intriguing formal and spatial quality. The brink is a liminal connection between the inner and outer, an aperture that reveals a scene beyond, a scene within, an impermeable membrane of sorts. Looking at all of these study diagrams together gives you an idea of my formal investigation as a whole. What if two of these studies combine together? It creates this interesting space in between and also has a relation between the two and using different, um, <clears throat> using a bridge to connect the two studies. Models here explore these studies in a three-dimensional realm. Layers stacked on each other create spatial ambiguity by collapsing plan and elevation through juxtaposition of scale, projection, and rotation. The site is in Chicago, southwest of the Loop, near the Chicago River. It is almost across the street from Bertrand Goldberg's River City Apartments. 
It is just a few blocks away from the University Institute of Chicago campus. Many organizations in Chicago advocate for the improvement of public education by leveraging the school model as a catalyst to transform communities. The pairing of the school as a program and my formal investigation becomes an interesting conversation adding to school technology. The axonometric drawing gives us an understanding of how these formal exploration interact with each other and ground and context. The colors here add a high level of contrast, which makes the transition spaces stand out. The circulation entails a series of lamps constantly slipping between the volumes, creating a shift in space, color, and hence experience. The atrium divides the public space from the private spaces. It also, it bring, apart from bringing in light, it is also a labyrinth of staircases connecting the two sides. The topography of Chicago is flat, therefore making it a datum to explore ground condition, the relation of the building to the sky, multiple entrances, and opens up a possibility to massing strategies. The main idea behind the massing was to look at two volumes of the same size, which snugly fit into each other, almost at the cusp of breaking apart. The negative space between the two volumes becomes the brink. You enter the building through a series of ramps, which collapses movement patterns. The depth in these plans, the color in these plans shows the depth and, the dis and differentiates the layers. The slippage between the volume creates an interesting dialogue, which changes levels of porosity to the outside. It also leads you to many unexpected experiences or simply to the banal. It becomes the focal point of feeling. The project is accumulation of uncanny moments which do not align to the norm. This involves a fusion of temporal spatial factors by intersecting, overlapping, um, and interlocking figures to build up into a sort of fluctuating configuration. The juxtaposition of these multiple layers of transitory spaces where each layer is slightly shifted, scaled, or mirrored. Successive stratification of space is a sequential order which produces lingering sense of anticipation and excitement. In designing these sequential spaces, the process began with, with understanding the circulation and designing that first before moving to other functional aspects of the building. So the inside is turned outward. The whimsical shifts plays an important role in how much you reveal to the outside or how much one can peek into the inside. Hence, the brink becomes the in-between. These model studies explains how all of this comes together as my formal investigation. A series of brink conditions explains transition of space through experience. The first set of brink studies shows the entrance to the main volume. The second set of brink diagrams shows the slippage between the two volumes on the interior of the space. The third set of ring diagrams explains the, the other entrance on the ground level. The fourth set of ring diagrams explains slipping between two levels in on the inside. And the last set of ring diagrams here explains the bridge connecting both the volumes. This thesis looks at various conditions of brinks and how they function based on function of character of play. It analyzes circulation, geometry, symmetry, and organization of spaces, ground condition, and the in interior functions, and the layout, and brings, it brink, and brings the brink to detail. It determines hierarchy of spaces, order and pace of organizational space, function, and level of complexity. Thank you.
Um, I'll share the link to the mirror board so you could look at these drawings in detail. Hey, uh, maybe this is what I was suggesting this morning. If you can share your screen and yeah. then what everybody can do where all the okay. little people show up on the side, just drag that way over so we can see everyone and the shared screen is small. Okay. This Zoom presentation conversation matrix, I don't think has been perfected yet. But if you, there, now we've made it so I can see everyone. Maybe it's better to go to your PDF instead of the Miro page and just put the link for the Miro page for everyone. That's just advice. I feel like every single review that we've had post COVID, there's a slightly different protocol and experiment that's being run. Yeah. <laughs> I actually found the, so sorry. <laughs> Forgive me, uh, I, I, I followed you, but would you, would you mind saying you know, 30 seconds about blink, blink again, just almost the beginning? Yeah, um, yeah so the idea behind blink, blink was to look at threshold spaces and how these spaces become the most important um, designing aspect of the building. And so I call it blink blink because at the moment, like it, it just takes about a second of that moment for it to completely change or transition spaces. So like it could be in the volume of the space or it could even be in color. So it becomes much more vivid and experiential. So it's a instantaneous. Yes. Like milliseconds or. Yeah, it's just like you turn around a corner and it's just like drastically different. So like the series of the blink, blink diagrams that I had um, shows that and if you look at the mirror page like I have like a short animation so you can look at how like it transitions like completely differently. You know, well, it's, it's like a section at a given point then. Yeah. Can you, can you explain those diagrams a little bit Priyanka you showed them but can you say exactly what those are the sequence ones? Um, yeah sure so an example is here so this is um, this, this is the bridge that connects the two buildings and um, so you walk through and then you see the entrance. Once you take the entrance, like it completely changes space. And these set of diagrams here explains is the experiential of space around you, like the amount of space available for you to walk through. And this shows is a graph that shows the compression and the expansion of spaces around you. In, in the red uh, diagonal at at, in the uh, isometric is, is uh, indicating that location of yeah, it. Yeah, so it shows where the moment of this drink happens. Right. Maybe go through the rest of them so we can. Uh, yeah, I have to go backwards. Just give me a second. So another yeah. example is this, which is the shifting between two levels. Have you experienced this in architecture before? Um, yeah, there have been moments where, so uh, the Schaulager by Horizon Demeron, like that is an example of it. And where like the entrance is like half underground and then you enter and then there's nothing beyond that. So like, I think that's one example of it. And I think I wanted to explore those moments because I thought they were quite interesting. Yeah, I was thinking of Alvaro Siza, uh, the earliest work, the stairway at the Porto, the faculty building in Porto. Um, but I, I, I'll be quick because um, Drake is correct. I took too long last time. It's the, I, I think your building doesn't have any, did I miss it? Does it have a specific program or did I um, miss it? It's a school. Obvious? It's a school. Okay, that's enough. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, you're doing this through projection and geometry and vision. So, you know, thus isometric and angles. And 
I'm thinking of a whole litany of, you're, you're reminding me of a whole litany of examples, John Hadek meditating on the hypotenuse in the diamond houses and, and, the, and the wall houses. Uh, later, uh, there's a, a neurologist teaches design at Stanford, Larry Leifer. Larry will say that humans don't focus for longer than seven seconds. So if you intend to communicate, you better break what you're saying every seven seconds because they'll never follow you. But I'm just thinking of like, you open up this incredible spectrum around instantaneous change. Um, when I was at your age, I was always staring at the Barcelona Pavilion and I thought if you went through two walls that were simply parallel, you would have an instantaneous change of space. And uh, it struck me that Mies was a master of that at some level. Yeah, I, I think your concept is extraordinary. Um, what, what do you imagine it would give to people? <laughs> I think Larry, it just moved. So. Larry Leifer's, well, Larry Leifer teaching design in the D school at Stanford. Larry's almost 80, but Larry's an engineer and a neurologist, and he's completely focused on how does the human body process experience. Uh, thus, I think of your, but he's also an engineer, so he wants to know exactly how it happened. Anyway, what would you give to people? What would this give to people? Like, I think it especially it being a school i think it just makes it more ex more into like intriguing and interesting to like children because it's a elementary school. and middle school so that's why like even the vivid colors to like play with that so it becomes more exciting and inviting to them so the school itself is a kind of mathematic project <laughs> it's not actually that complex like when you look at it it's just it <laughs> It is perceived to be that way, but actually, like it's like it, it, like when you see it as a whole, like it is actually pretty simple to like maneuver around. Yeah. So I have a representational question. Um, I really enjoy the drawings, these like two D sort of renderings you have um, for your project. I'm just wondering what the lines on top of everything. Are, are for what the um, that was. Yeah, so I was talking about like projection and scale. So these are just like um, lines extruded from like one of the angles and it just like, it looked like an interesting overlay and it just added like a layer of complexity since I'm talking about layers and stacking layers on each other. Mm -hmm. huh. So it's like bringing in like different concepts. Okay preferred if they I mean I like what they're doing I just wish they weren't on top of your project itself right so if you know we could see your your building a little bit more clearly and that would fall to the background I think would be a little bit more successful because I'm not gonna lie it's a little con like distracting a little distracting and like busy for me especially when I'm trying to read where um those openings are sort of lining up like yeah um the lines going across it are sort of taking my eye in like a bunch of different directions i feel like it's not helping you as much um do you mind flipping to photos of your model yeah sure we should ask Andrew about some of the extra lines in the Sixth Street drawings. Of <laughs> They're not extra lines. <laughs> lines whatsoever. Well, we've got them here 25 years later. <laughs> or are we going to ask Daniel Liebeskin about some of his extra lines? Because <laughs> uh, uh, that's who I think you're asking an important question. Um, you get paid by the line. <laughs> yes. That's what I got at Morphosis, a dollar a line. <laughs> Can, when I write you, about Steve Hall, I get a dollar a word. Can you can you go back to the other uh, uh, picture? I think it's one slide or two slides back. This one. Yeah. Yeah. It's not my favorite image of my body, but <laughs> <laughs> why the like color it. change here as well? Sorry. Uh, why the color change here as well from your um, trunk, your model, and then this rendering? I feel like the color palette's like. Kind of related, but not exactly. It it it, it looks bleached out in this, but it, it should it should ideally be like the previous one. Mm, okay. And hence, this is not my favorite image of my. I, I, okay. 
Oh, go to your favorite one. I'm sorry. Don't don't stop. Keep going. I think this one is a good image. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So is color, what is color for you? Is is color paint or is color material? What 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 does it represent? Um, that's a hard question. Um, color is actually really important and like it's an important way for me to like see and differentiate things more than anything else. And um, hence I found it like really interesting to play with materials and colors. But, and so material is a product, of, like, the color is a product of the material. So like when you look at like natural objects, like you associate that object with the color specifically to make it easier for you to break it down into its characteristics, I guess. Right. Right, because we spoke about that at, at midterm as well. Like you, the drawings you had created were a little, um, in terms of the color shift, from yeah. one to another was a little bit confusing. So um, I like that there's sort of a continuity in terms of like your math and diagrams to the actual like sections and um, renderings. So we can understand like the formal relationships or the games you're playing with. The yeah. can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you just go back a few slides? Uh, Cause, and this is interesting, Sanatu was on the, the earlier review as well. You know, there's these studies which are quite ambiguous and at the same time, I think, quite compelling. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the project just had to do with, now, how do these even become three-dimensional and become a building? And I think that's, in a, in a certain way, that's been like the labor of the thesis, if not actually the, the theme of it. Right, yeah. Um, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the early... Uh, yeah, the first few images. Yeah. And there's lots and lots of them. I know you edited them down uh, uh, severely, but yeah, all, all, the whole you know, the whole sequence of these, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Andrew, that's that. I, I think that that's a very, for me, very empowering comment. The labor of the thesis versus the, but you know, I'm sorry, I'm making uh, offering too many quotes here. But uh, over the last decade, one of the things you would hear Bernard Schumi speak about as a professor more so than an architect, was a period of time in which he thought a division, a director and a, a director producing uh, content for, for themselves versus producing content for a producer, an architect producing drawings for the discourse rather than for the owner, the public, the audience. And Bernard, uh, to, to make a long story short, he's, he, he was lamenting and he, he spent a lot of time thinking that Today, a lot of the drawings you see produced in architecture schools are simultaneously for the public and for the discipline. So instead of a director having a secret cut that they think is the best movie and then having to release the one that's gonna sell more tickets. So I bring that up because I think not to that question about those lines, what they are. Part of what's going on here is there is some sort of discourse that's the, the mechanics of the architectural thought. Right. And then that's a precursor, presumably, for the human experience, which is the blank brink. Right. So in other words, that, that labor comment, Andrew, to me is powerful because while you're in the throes of that, you might be producing lines that are more for you than for someone else. Mm -hmm. But then because it's an architecture, eventually it is for someone else. Um, it's not a private poem. So um, I think people asking you about those extra lines is, is a formidable question. I, I don't mean that you wouldn't, I do think you've done quite amazing. You know, it's, I think of Carpenter Center. <laughs> I think of any uh, Adolf Loos and the Romplan uh, Caesar, any number of buildings where somehow there was supposed to be a, a tremendous change in a moment. Uh, Andrew or, 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 or anybody, when, when I was a freshman, they handed us um, Rudolf Arnheim. <laughs> That's a long time ago. But wasn't Arnheim largely about experiencing architecture through motion? I remember finding it just that you're in this whole, you're in a very broad lexicon of experience through motion. And yeah. then more specifically, you have drawings that are flat that insinuate volume and depth, but are reluctant to produce it. <laughs> 
It's, it's, it's as if as soon as you would dilate the page and allow volume, you want to kind of crush it back down. Um, right. Yeah, Andrew, wasn't, I mean, I remember being handed I've got that my copy one. right here. I, I, I brought it up because I assume you would. It's all my, I just remember being I was handed just that one. yesterday. <laughs> well, when I, I remember getting that at about 19, but then, you know, 20, 30 years later, meeting Greg Lynn and realizing I should have read it closer. Because, you know, Greg obviously was a monster at understanding that stuff, as are you, Andrew. And, and then holding up my computer, I've got uh, Shumi, the. Yeah. And the Libra skin. So, uh, so Priyanka, I, I just think that in some sense, almost if, if you were talking to a psychiatrist, you might be saying something like, I'm an architect and I'm supposed to make volume, but I don't want to. Uh, I'm an architect and my lines are supposed to produce space for other people, but I'm only willing to produce the most momentary transitory space. Mm. And um, this sounds like I'm a cruel architect because I don't want to nurture people. I want to have them constantly in transformation but I think that's actually the euphoria of life. And the shrink would say, yes, you don't have to feel guilty. Um, <laughs> I mean, Mark Wigley would have an amazing time with this project. Um, but, I, but that's, and then maybe you would ask yourself, are there other projection systems that you could explore? Right. So for example, if Greg Lynn got involved, then you had to use splines rather than lines. Um, what would happen? Or maybe your lines are producing experiential splines. I, I think it's it's quite a sophisticated project. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. How often does a screen change during a typical commercial? Isn't it blink, blink, blink? Like 80 hertz refresh rate and people, people, I mean, the stimulation to the optic nerves from a typical Coca-Cola ad is probably a million times faster than your project. Yeah, that's something to think about. <laughs> I think, well, you're in LA, the epicenter of media and television and entertainment. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Andrew, you had that book right there. If anybody would, I thought it'd be you. Okay. <laughs> Priyanka, I am curious, like, uh, so you started with a completely two dimensional kind of sequence of studies. Is that right? Like, similar to what we see on the page. Okay. So you basically produce these compositions um, and then the next step was to translate them into 3D. Is, was that the kind of process? Yeah, so I started with these and I thought they were interesting because they almost had a three-dimensional quality to them. Right. And hence made it much more difficult to actually make a three-dimensional form or a volume, I would say. Um, but yeah, that was my process. I'm, I'm just curious, you know, I mean, I cannot now think of Peter Eisenman's uh, twisted cubes and uh, process of, you know, three-dimensionalizing two-dimensional forms. Uh, but um, I wonder if you could, um, and I'm sure you probably did go through these steps and you just don't have time to show everything, but like, it would be really interesting to uh, see basically taking the upper right, the kind of more colorful composition, which by the way, I found is really beautiful, especially the color one, because there are so many readings within that flat composition uh, that imply space and volume that could be translated into 3D. But I would be curious to see um, your kind of more, or, a rigorous process of translation, right? So meaning, first I pull just the vertices in a certain height, right, of each color. And then I connect them with, with planes. Second, um, I just take the intersecting lines or the intersection points of these, uh, you know, color forms and pull them in a certain, but basically, you know, having a little bit more of a kind of rigorous process of translation step by step, which maybe you did. I, I, I don't know if you did, um, you know, um, would also help me uh, understand, you know, like the kind of translation process and also how you arrived to some of those in between spaces. Uh, I find, I mean, like the model, your favorite model shot is my favorite model shot, by the way. I think that one is definitely the best. Uh, can you actually go to it, please? Just the one. Yes. Um, and well, I'm looking at it at, on Miro, but. Um, I 
because I think also uh, your interior space, what you created, you know, like looking, yeah, this one. Yeah, I love it. I think I would literally take those people out and put like, what are these, 116 scale? 132. 132 even. So I would probably put like 116 or potentially 18 scale people there. Yeah. Somehow this, this, this building to me uh, wants to be smaller um, and the transitions want to be a little bit more strategic and fewer. Because I think what happened, uh, looking at the sections especially, uh, is th there's too much going on in between. And I think the project really lies in between the kind of slippages of the very few primary forms. But I think because you then introduce so many kind of floor plates and ramps and staircases and everything in between, uh, it got a little bit confusing. But this specific view of the model and the massic from the outside has a certain clarity to me at least, that uh, some of the kind of later drawings that you were showing started to, you know, a little bit fall apart because there are, there's so much going on. But I wonder if, yeah, if you were to think of this on like, again, a scale that is half of what you have currently, mm -hmm. uh, if, if it would help. Um, because I think like, I don't know, like I assume you started with, you know, very abstractly you chose a site yeah. based on, we, we didn't know, like it, it could be anywhere really, right? This thing could be anywhere and it could be really anything. Like meaning it could be a house, it could be a hospital, it could be anything. Like to, to you, it doesn't really matter, right? Which is totally fine. What really matters is that the kind of spatial conditions that you are creating, right? Um, yeah. Are the blink brink uh, moment. And therefore, I would really strongly suggest to kind of simplify, um, you know, what would you take on so you can really just focus. I mean, like, it would be amazing if somebody said, like, my, my thesis is all about this one threshold, which is the door between these two rooms. And literally, that's what you focus on, right? And it would be, and you have like hundreds of studies just on that. Uh, but you kind of just, really zoom in on something very, very specific, right? Which has to do really with experience and threshold and moving through space. Uh, because it seems to me that that's what, that's what you are after. But I think because at the end you had, you know, it, it was in Chicago, it was some kind of a school, art school or something, or just school, I don't know. I, it had yeah. to have right, staircases and all of that. It started to a little bit uh, uh, complicate things, I think. <laughs> No, I mean you are you are like yes, no, it, I know. <laughs> it, it I do completely understand that, and um, I did start off with something much smaller, and mm -hmm. I felt mm -hmm. that like since I was then I kept adding to it, and that and it became two instead of one, and then like the process it became like so elongated, and then I, I decided to do a school, so then like fitting all of the functional aspects to it. It took, I felt like it took away a little bit from these moments, but also like I was trying to keep true to the blink or the brink conditions itself and hence maybe complicated it a bit too much, I guess. Mm. What's interesting about this um, re reminds me a lot of things. I mean, I, I was educated in the mid nineties at, at the AA and, and actually that's where I met Andrew and um, uh, I was being taught by Baram Shardell, who uh, was doing uh, a lot of these uh, sort of um, two-dimensional to three-dimensional sort of exercises, and and and, and sort of ended up reminding me of, of Baram's um, uh, you know floating Buddhas in Nara in the Nara Convention Center, because not only did he take the diagrams of Rene Tom, which is a mathematician, and basically, I guess manipulated those into what the form of the convention center was. He was also floating some spaces within, inside the project that basically started to talk about interstitial spaces and, and, and other concepts. And, and I think at the end, uh, uh, I guess like Merzla was saying, it's, it's, it, it doesn't matter where it is because the conversation is about space. 
in, in how to sort of try to formalize this, this new um, uh, sort of non-modernist uh, sort of condition of universality and all these things. And, 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 and it's interesting because it, it was back in the nineties and, and I was listening to uh, Pierre Eisman and, and uh, 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 the other day with, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the Italian uh, Marco uh, uh, Caprio, I think. Mario Carpo. Yeah, yeah Mario Carpo. And, then, and they were yeah. talking about lateness and, and which was interesting about how maybe this, 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 this sort of techniques are, are uh, were not, are, are not late in meaning that they're at the end of their journey or as, or as a kind of a, uh, um, movement. But they're late in the sense that they are now have new relationships with the world of today, and and so I think Eisen was making a real strong case, sort of to keep kind of this investigation alive. But 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 it's interesting how you your project sort of tends to be in that discussion, which I find uh, very interesting because it then it it brings us back to your generation uh, these these questions of uh, architectural autonomy. Could you go back to some of the sections, yes. section drawings you did? Yeah, one more. Yeah, that one. Yeah, either one. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, I think there's a lot of facility going on here, and I wanted to just point out maybe a couple little details that I really like that I think are. Uh, really important and uh, I try not to annotate too much. I'm just going to make a little circle mm -hmm. um, right there, like there and, and there. It happens in a couple other places. Uh, like, of course, we know there's a building and it's attached to a foundation and there's retaining walls and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, by just trying to make that edge or that wedge as if the thing is actually wedged in the ground, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, is really important. And there's a, there's a lot of things like that in the project. Let me clear it because I, I don't want to have my graffiti on your nice drawings. Uh, uh, but there's moments of, uh, and, 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 I, and I might say that I, I, I appreciate you challenging yourself to make that kind of work and to deal with uh, a kind of building inside a building that frees up its facade in a certain kind of way and um, uh, offers a kind of scalelessness to the outside uh, by negating floor plates and the rhythms of you know the 12 foot line that we know of in buildings so there's actually some really quite expert things going on on the on the interior of the volume um, that I think are the are the kind of result of the studies that um, some of my colleagues are quite fond of, uh, uh, but but I guess I would point to some of the resolution of some of these things. Now, maybe some are a little awkward, the stairs, et cetera, but in some places, but there's some quite uh, interesting spaces that occur. I think it could be, John, a, a, a hydraulic kind of building. <laughs> yeah, right. I like mean, sitting in the... In the yeah, floor. that it's, that there's some form of that allows that telescoping quality. Um, I was trying to imagine recently, you know, we designing something and we got it to be very light and then we were trying to design helical foundations and then we started trying to think about a liquid foundation and start trying to think about floating a building. And so John, your comments to me, I think you're, you're complete. That's very interesting to focus on those details and you know, uh, Priyanka, I, I see years ago, I remember Rafael Maneo saying something about autonomy to the effect of, if you understood a building to be an autonomous language, it could be equivocal or not equivocal. It, it might be useful for nothing, or it might be useful for something. And uh, I'm sure I'm mangling uh, Maneo 25 years later, but it does seem like part of following what John Enright just brought up there if you experiment and it starts to produce things that are not resolved in your mind and that are different than the things you began with. 
So the blink brink thing produced a strange detail like that, John, that then you pursue that rather than the first theme. Um, you know, it's, uh, do you remember writing a paper in school where you get to the last paragraph and your professor or teacher tells you that should be the first one and you should start over? So it, it might be that the project somehow, its real finding is in these odd, the few, the 5% of the project that surprised you the most and is unreconciled. Um, to, me, to me, that's really interesting. Like, does the building need a different type of foundation? Yeah, I, I didn't really go into the depth of that. No, I know, but your, your yeah. professor was noting those corners, which I agree with, yeah. I'm not taking the saying this is a challenge, but it's the degree to which, you know, architecture school revolves around 14 week semesters that go from not having a project to having a project. And in the end, we argue the project and largely try to show people that we achieved what we said we were trying to achieve, or we made an amazing breakthrough, as opposed to maybe in a more experimental way, coming to the end of that 14 weeks and asking yourself, is there something that is uniquely valuable and 95% of the project while being strong is in fact not the achievement? Your project might be like that. I think a lot of these projects are really experiments, yeah. Uh, let me ask you a question, Baraka. Is this your first time working on a project with angles like this? Yeah. Yes. And was it fun? Ho hopefully so. I say but that because... I mean, it, go ahead. Go ahead. It, it's more the scale. Like, I have worked on angles, but, like, this is more the scale because it was much larger than I have done ever before, and I guess... Mm -hmm. Why well, the reason I asked that question is because you know the the more you uh, you experiment uh, with things, the more you learn about them in terms of how you handle things and what does not work. So it, sometimes it comes down to the more experience you have. You know, next time you might deal with a, a building that has curvature on it, and you learn from that as well. So uh, for me, it seems like you had a good time with this. It seems like you enjoyed it. Uh, it. It was kind of experimentation. Some things worked, maybe some things didn't work. But but I I I feel good about it that you felt that you were in control uh, and came out with a good product per se. So uh, so I like that. Thank you. I think Renee is saying you might be part of an autonomy project. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, uh, uh, those were the days, <laughs> right? I don't know. You're the guy that takes me around Tijuana and explains it to me socio-politically, culturally. <laughs> <laughs> You're a unique guy, Renee, with your <laughs> multiple, yeah. I, I don't mean to be, I, I'm aware of the lateness argument that Eisenman, uh, I just actually got a request to review the book. Um, I took lateness as also a kind of sense, uh, the little bit I've read of it, that a, a building might not be up, a project might not be up to the moment in terms of addressing what's going on now. Uh, and that in fact could be part of its value. But Bianca, I, I was just keep trying to think of ways in which a blue sky scientist might work on something that they're not sure has value. Uh, to, you know, like and National Science Foundation is, is sort of known these days for demanding more, a shorter term horizon of relevance. This will be important in 10 years. But I think in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, National Science Foundation and those kind of granting organizations thought that something might be relevant in a hundred years. So somebody working on, you know, something chemical, nuclear or whatever, you didn't have to show it had use right away. And I think today we're in a world where we're expected to show relevance quicker for good reason. Yeah. So your project, you, it might not be clear that it has relevance. I think the Eisenman thing is partially that it's like, you know, because there's so much pressure to address now and there's so much dire human need that 
it would seem negligent not to try to address now. But uh, Eisenman, Eisenman surely is not particularly one who buys into that, not with architecture anyway. If he's, if he's listening, I'm sure we'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get an email. <laughs> so, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah you but, um, but I think making it a, one thinks of Tom Main's uh, Diamond Ranch School. That was kind of a you amazing breakthrough for Morphosis to do a public building like that. And anyway, I speaking too much. I these are we've seen four really interesting experimental projects, guys. So thank you. Well, we have one more. Um, if there's any last comments for Priyanka, Priyanka, thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Thesis at home. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see any food getting delivered in the background or anything. Okay. And uh, we have Lorenzo Vaz Pinto next, and you're going to be the anchor, Lorenzo. So the uh, Zoom platform is yours. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I know it's been a long afternoon or night or morning, depending on where you are. Um, so uh, thank you for being here today and to those watching in the live stream as well. Uh, a little bit of, of background. So my name is Lorenzo, as John said, I'm from Lisbon, Portugal. I received my bachelor in architecture from the Lisbon School of Architecture. Um, and the thesis uh, presented here today uh, contains a, a theoretical idea accompanied with a project and the project was mostly used to experiment and speculate the ideas presented today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. I'm also sharing on the chat a link to the website, but you don't need to open it if you don't want to, since I'll be sharing everything so you can uh, keep up with it. Uh, let's see. Where are you? And oops. Sorry, my browser closed. All right. So I hope everyone can see that. Um, okay, so my thesis um, is called blank. Um, to begin with, um, I, I'm, the thesis will mostly be presented through a video format but I just want to situate myself and, and, and you as well, a little bit in where I think I'm standing and where I position a thesis um, in the architectural discourse. So this diagram essentially represents uh, where I think the thesis lies. Uh, you can see here blank architecture, uh, which is kind of embedded into the background and into activity. And you can see here non-blank architecture that kind of perforates and breaks through the foreground and it's kind of in your personal space as well. And so that's how I look at some of the new stuff that, that's been showing up, some of it not so new, that kind of is extraneous, doesn't really need that much complexity. Um, and so I position myself and my viewpoints and the thesis as well uh, in here. Um, so let's go jump back into the presentation. So I'm gonna start, if anyone later or um, whenever you want, wants to explore the site, the site has some of the process and progress that the project has taken. So you'll feel uh, a little bit more understanding about what's been happening and how I arrived to the situation where I'm at. Um, so I'm gonna start with a video. I'm gonna share it here. Um, and I hope the sound is okay. Uh, actually, I need to stop the share and share again so that the sound is on. Sorry about that. Share computer sounds. Okay. Wouldn't want to spend an entire video without any narration. All right. Um, so I'm going to start the video. Enjoy. <laughs> Blankness. Something empty, devoid, meaningless, expressionless, sure you can hear the video, incomplete. Right? The idea of blankness bases itself on something that is empty, but the fundamental concept of it requires something to exist and contain the emptiness. It is the thing, the object 
the container that is of interest, for it dictates blankness. But how can blankness be applied to architecture? Blankness can be defined as designed emptiness. As such, it is the container of emptiness, not to be confused with a simple white wall, which contains nothing. Blank exists on the base concept of background, of something empty that is ready to be filled in, and until it is filled in, it maintains its proper position in the background. Blank manifests itself from afar as a singular object, much like a neutral canvas, but when inspected closer, the mass is perceived through layers and manufactured by Pochet. The layers within the object represent an alternative to the part, producing differentiation without fragmentation. Layers are contiguous, not discreticized. A whole may be layered and remain internally self-consistent, whether cut, extracted, or excavated. This idea of a new type of blankness proposes and assumes architecture as a struggle between background and foreground. It at all times purposely holds architecture in a state of pure blankness, using an architectural container that is reductive and simple. This container holds and hides the architecture, which only flows out when absolutely required. The architecture is then presented as a dichotomy between container and contained, background and foreground. The contained mass stems from the idea of object continuity, background cohesion, and mass injection towards utilization. The mass, when absolutely necessary, creeps, shifts, and structures the foreground into existence, thus presenting people and their activities as a spatial point of focus. By getting rid of the unnecessary, the decorative, and the frivolous, the mass is a connecting point of function. It flows out to become a rail, a step, or seating. And when its utility is no longer needed, the architectural gestures retreat back into their container, to their original blank state. Blank looks at efficiency, modularity, complexity, and decoration as architectural moves that are not sought after but repelled as unnecessary extraneous add-ons to architecture. As such, the architectural paraphernalia of lights, doors, windows, and technical objects are considered enemies of blank space, for they represent the module and the mass-produced component, for they bring unnecessary complexity to what should be subtle and complete space. And as such, are consistently embedded into the architecture, killing the idea of the added component. The idea of blank rids architecture of its extraneous symbology, political and cultural capital, and just allows space to exist unhindered by irrelevant exterior ideas. And it is through these methods, blank proposes space that is ready for activity connection and life from its users. Blank is nothing more than something ready to be filled in, and until then, it remains in its rightful place, the background. So thank you for watching. Um, I'm going to share now my website. Okay, so I'm just going to play this in the background. Um, oops, it's a bit slow. So I think my Zoom is telling me it's crashed, which is not great. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Um, yep, so besides the, the animation, the video that kind of showcases and, and presents the thesis, I, I'm showing the drawings kind of to deconstruct a little bit. Uh, but this, before that, so essentially the building is in Osaka um, for the um, World Expo in 2025. Um, J Osaka is essentially uh, receiving a lot of money to produce this man-made island that's out in the middle of the coast. It's not even really close to Osaka. And the downtown area has become quite um, uh, fragile and with not a lot of life. So this building, the program of it, uh, essentially uh, works only as a public space. It has no other utility than it. Um, but again, the building was more of a, a test bed to the idea of the thesis than anything else. Uh, an important thing that was kind of a discovery through the process of the thesis um, was the Poche became really important because it's what allows me to produce the effect that I am producing. Uh, and so essentially the building ends up being kind of a, a dichotomy between container and contain. So the glass box and the white mass inside or concrete mass inside, uh, which can be seen also in section. Uh, and then there are these uh, moments uh, which are very rare and, and significant when happen, which is when the mass uh, kind of perforates and flows out of the glass box. And that's when, you know, you have a certain level of functionality to the building. Uh, and that's when it kind of breaks through the background and interacts with the idea of activity. Um, and so um, that kind of structures the foreground as is said by the animation. Um, so there have been some massing tests, some elevations, and the chair was kind of a starting point of, of reflection and design towards the building as well. Uh, so I'm curious to see what you think. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Can I just ask a quick question because you ended on the chair? Um, just like in a couple of sentences, can you explain a little bit more the relationship or significance of the chair within, within your thesis? Sorry, I think my, uh -oh. I think my headphones stopped working. <sighs> Sorry about this. Can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear you now. Sorry about that. Okay, can you, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. No, it was a, before any comment, it was a simple question because you you ended your uh, presentation with, the com with a short comment on the chair. And so I was just curious how the chair play, you know, what put the role of the chair is within, within the process or how it fits within the larger thesis. Um, right, so, um, so, Essentially, the chair ended up being a starting point because it's it's a, a functional object, right? Uh, but we can still go to museums and expositions that work on the chair as an art piece. Uh, and I think that's quite relevant for the idea of architecture. Uh, and so the chair kind of struck me because, you know, when I look at most chairs nowadays, they're uh, manufactured, they're produced, they're, they, they have components and parts in them. Um, and I, I realize that's based on the idea of the industrialization of society and so on, but I, I essentially see no point to it uh, being as complex as it is. Um, and so I started working on the chair as uh, it became, it started with just the kind of concrete mass, and then I added an extra layer, and that's where the idea of, of layers that kind of construct the object. So the idea is that the object is not made out of components, which then have parts, but the object is just the succession of layers, and that produces a singular object a, and a more precise architecture. 
What's the chunk out of the back? Uh, sorry, the what? You have a yeah. chunk taken out of the back. And this, this in the front seat part. And then, right. and then the hole punched in the building. That's the most thing I want to know. So um, the the punch at the end. I think you're mentioning this, right? Yeah. That one, yeah. Yeah. So I'm. Mean, this is. Um, it's interesting because everyone reacts a little bit differently. Um, but so the idea of the punch in the wall. Uh, this relates to the work done previously in in thesis prep, which is the idea that um, I I want I want architecture that doesn't have all these components and unnecessary things. And so it made sense to me that the easiest way to make a window without the window frame and without going to a, a, a depot and, and buy the window and, and put it in, in, in the facade is to just punch a wall in the hall, the wall, and that produces a window. So it, it was, it's a simple move. And it also ends up showing that this isn't just a surface, but it's a mass and that it's a physical. And, 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 and so it shows also time. You can also see on the left, you know, it's a little bit of breakage. So it isn't just this clean, perfect, beautiful, but it, it shows time and, and usage as well. See, I feel like I, I personally like, I prefer when you like mention it as a way to show that it's like a mass, like that there's continuity in the actual material itself rather than it being like, um, a way to show like use or, or aging or, or degradation of any kind, right? Because that to me sounds more intentional than like, oh, this is like a feature that shows that this space has been like worn down. Do you know what I mean? Um, I have, um, what well, might be a simple question, which probably will require a really elaborate answer but uh so you mentioned something um uh what you mentioned during uh, or I, I the animation mentioned um something about the lack of um uh, details and modularity and you know uh, fixtures and so forth in order to achieve this blank space uh is blank and and smooth the same for you? So that's I think that's a really relevant question um, and has been asked several times during the process. It's kind of a, a complicated thing, right? Because the the word blank, even though it it has a, a definition in the in the dictionary, it actually has too many definitions to to, to go through. Um, but so I tried to produce my own definition of how I apply it to architecture. But uh, to answer your question, um, I would say I would say it's not really about being smooth or sharp, or about about being um, uh, perfectly constructed or eroded. But it's more about the idea that there's a certain quality that the materials bring together, and there's a certain idea of layers instead of parts and components. Because if we look at, a, at a, a building or a toy that has a lot of moving mechanisms and it has a lot of things in it, it will be very hard to call that blank. But if you grab that you know, toy or building or whatever it is, and you kind of strip it down from all of those, I would call them unnecessary geometries, you end up with a blank object, no matter if it is a complex surface or a sharp surface or, or a smooth surface. So that's that's my viewpoint, and that's how I kind of see it, and that's how I try to apply it to the project itself. I mean, I find your thesis really intriguing, and I look the the presentation is really beautiful. Um, the animation was really clear and compelling, and kind of seductive uh, in its presentation and its narration. Um, the, the drawings that you have, you know, on the screen here are very clear and kind of beautifully executed. Um, so I, I think there is a certain sensibility that you are after. And I think, uh, you know, the question of blank space, is that it, it's a, such a kind of um, a, ephemeral thing to go after in a way, right? Um, and so I, I, in a way, I commend you. <laughs> for like kind of going on down this path. Uh, I think it's a really kind of complicated uh, question 
uh, to ask, like, what, what is blank architecture? Not blank space, but you are after blank architecture, if I understand, because you at the end chose to design a building, right? Um, but um, there are so, so many, you know, questions in my mind related to the, the smooth, but also the color, the texture, the construction or constructability of buildings. Um, the scale of uh, architecture as opposed to the scale of an object, which uh, starts to really <laughs> put your kind of blankness or the concept of blank into, you know, into question. Like, it, it, in other words, is, is it even achievable? Like, hey, through, after going through this process, uh, what, what is the conclusion in the end? I'm kind of like curious, like, are, do you think that you, you achieved what you set yourself to, to achieve? So I, um, that's a hard question, but... I know, I'm sorry, and I'm only <laughs> asking because I look like, I think like you've really pushed it, you know, like far, and I really appreciate a lot of these moments that I think like you crafted really beautifully. Um, so yeah, I'm, yes, it's a hard question, but I'm hoping that hopefully you have some, some answer for yourself almost, right? As, as you kind of went through this process. Yeah, I um, so I would say that because of how, as you said, ephemeral the word is essentially, I think it's very hard to just to start this project and just reach a conclusion in, in three months. So I look at this as more as a, a start of what I hope to be a professional career or something that I can continue to explore and try and experiment. Uh, this is quite essentially the first stab at it. Um, it was very hard because sometimes uh, it's like that old saying where sometimes it's easier to design a building when there's a site and there's a lot of constrictions because that kind of tightens you up. But with the word blank, it, it's so open and so um, just out there that it's kind of hard to uh, focus it and bring it down. Um, but I think to a certain point, I'm, I'm actually quite satisfied with it. Um, but I know that I can continue working on it and there's still a lot more to dig. You know, this is, this is Drake. I, you know, for me, it's, I'm, I know I'm overly simplifying this, but, but it's almost like you're, 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 you take a blank canvas, you're a painter, you take a canvas and it's, it's, and it's blank until you start painting. So when you have the example of, of the, the space, the room, uh, I, I took from that when you start injecting a, a bench and a and a counter, it, it's like you begin to paint on the canvas in that blank space, and it, then it becomes something else. Mm -hmm. But 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 one thing that I question I have for you is that is it necessarily most of your your spaces and your 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 rooms were they were cur they were cur curvilinear. They're, either the base of them curve or the walls curved. How how critical is that element in this blank space per se? Because it seems to be all it seems to be deliberate and it seems to be everywhere. Um, right. So I think um, to answer that, I have to. Uh, that's complicated. So I and. In a simple way, I would say that I believe that the moments where you actually interact with the building, so I'm not just saying you enter the building or you're walking down a corridor, but I say when you sit, when you need a rail, when you need a stair or, or some sort of activity where you're actually formally in contact with the building, you know, there's no point to having something sharp. Uh, I right. look at sharp things as mm -hmm. uncomfortable or maybe cold or, or hurtful, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. smooth is a lot more comfortable, right, and, and ergonomic. Mm -hmm. So uh, the distinction here is uh, you can look at it as a gradient. So the far the farther away the building is from you and from you having contact from it, the sharper and kind of the, the colder and just reductive it is, and the closer you get and the, 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 the closer the contact you have, then it becomes smoother and, and more appro appropriate for you, I would say. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, well, it does. The stair is a good example. When you go up the stair, rather the riser and uh, go straight across, you, you curve it, and and, uh, and it, it blends into the the rail system. 
So it's almost organic where it begins to grow out of it. One could, and obviously that's what I was trying to say. Obviously that seems to be a better approach for you. But I was just wondering, could you keep it straight and still have the same argument in terms of how you approach it? So, but, but that's it. Um, uh, thank you. The presentation was great. Can you go to, I don't know about the, the music, the music background I always think is funny, but <laughs> it's like, it's but, the hardest part of the project. You know, I don't think, I don't think presentations need it, but that's just me. Hey, can you go to that playing with mass or whatever that section is in your website? Really interesting. Um, at this level, and obviously a building is far more complicated than the project I'm going to refer to, but there was a, a, a thesis project from two years ago or three years ago, Makiko Takasego. I know John knows it well. She was trying to make nothing. Do you know the project? Yeah. It's been he a long time to figure out how to just not he, to make anything. He saw it. Yeah. yeah. It was it discussed. Was my, it, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, it's, you know, so, you know, for sure, the chances of it not working at a building scale are much, much higher. So, you know, that's not, I think, a, a, the yardstick to use. But what I'm thinking of when it comes to the interior, and this maybe relates to, to Drake's observation about the, you know, like in a photography studio when they have the filleted ground, what, what do they call that? The coving? You know, they have a white background in a photography studio that's a curve? Yeah, I forgot what that's and, called. And so it's a lot of like, this maybe goes a way to think about the blank. It's like, you don't do that because you want to see a curve. You do it because you don't want to see two surfaces and you can't tell where the surface breaks. So right. it's almost like every time I can see a curve is where the problem is in your project. Like curves are not there because then it starts looking as if it's a kind of Maya curvy, you know, mm -hmm. old fashioned project. And I understand why, like the thing that we see right there, right? Then it sort of looks like a kind of other kind of project, you know? Something that we've been doing at Columbia 20 years ago or something. Is that right, Michael? That one? So, well, Bill McDonald and Evan and still doing it. Yeah, still Shulan, doing it. Shulan, yeah. Shulan, so, yeah. so well, I would doing it. TWA. Yeah, that's right. So, what you want to do, it seems like you want to use that tool, but not to make it look like it's a curve. It's kind of like the photography studio where you want to make it, you curve it so it doesn't look like anything. And that's, you know, I like, I like that problem. And I think, I would only suggest that maybe it it could be more blank is it's one of these things like when you when you blank a blank base a thesis or a project on a word. I always think there's just too many definitions. You know, maybe you need to find a very specific spatial effect and a very specific architectural a handful of architectural devices that you want, and then you do a big complicated building. So you know, God bless you, it's going to end up there's a toilet somewhere and it can't be disappear, or, you know, or there'll be messes to clean up. And you know, so we understand it'll, it'll fail at some point because of the size and complexity of it. But, but maybe um, in, in going backwards now, and I think this was maybe uh, something that Miroslava was talking about in, that, in another project showing you something you, you could have done, um, that now you go through this and you can take this catalog of effects and these are your experiments and you could throw out half of them, you know, it's either about punching a hole in the wall or it's not, you know, I don't think it, it now they seem like this is not a, don't think this is a criticism, but some of it seems like a little bit like a sampler board, you know, I tried one of these, I tried one of these, I'm not quite sure which one gives me the blank, the kind of ambient music, maybe that'll do it. <laughs> so Brian Eno, music for airports, <laughs> that might do it. Um, well, there. I, the comments pre that lead up to this. Uh, not, not to, I was just about to say something. Oh, please. <laughs> I just wanted to call attention to uh, the diagram you showed us initially um, and sort of contrasting that to the definition you gave um, Miroslava as to your like um, approach to blankness. You sort of described it as a series of like layers where I feel like the diagram you've shown or the one you've drawn is really more about like individual parts that have relations like that have a relationship to each other. Um, so I wonder like whether or not, um, you know, it's worth looking at the project you've made and reassessing the diagram as a point of like, um, or maybe redoing the diagram as a point to like push, as a way to like push the project forward, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I find the project completely fascinating and on its on a certain set of terms, I think it's quite an achievement. Uh, I don't know how much reading you were doing around history theory or contextualizing your, your work. And of course, in 10 minutes, you can't really reveal that. So it's understandable. But I, I do agree with Andrew that and some of the, other, the first question I think about smoothness versus blankness. Uh, I think I have the terminology wrong. But if you don't, can I share a screen? Would that be obnoxious? I really want to show you something. Go um, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. This is one thing about Zoom that I think is great. Um, because it's, it's, you're going to say, I know this already, I think. Um, can you see a Robert Slutsky painting? Yeah, these are from, this is, this is a PDF. It's 14 paintings from an exhibition in 1984. Well, and, it's uh, a really expensive book. Yeah, I, uh, you, yeah, you would know. Yeah, I actually went to the original show. Uh, I, I was in, I was uh, a student uh, at Berkeley then, um, just started. But I bring it up because I had a painting teacher at, at Berkeley who helped me understand these paintings. It's this got to do with you originally said to have blankness, you need you need to make something that produces the blankness. And to me, you're kind of, I feel like you're a little bit in a 1980s Derridian argument about frames and that you need a frame to produce emptiness. And then if you start to meditate on the frame, can you get rid of the frame? I think you're getting rid of the frame by making it continuous. But the degree to which, you know, somebody like a performance artist, Vito Acconci, you know, and, you know or Robert Irwin or Robert Smithson going out to the desert or Anyway, degrees to which people sort of altered what a frame is, if, if they even had one. But the description, that, uh, the reason I'm obnoxiously showing this is a, a painter named David Simpson at Berkeley back in the 80s looked at this and he goes, well, what Slutsky's doing, he learned this from Albers, who he studied with at Yale, was the square in the center is the same color as the torus in the perimeter. So the implication that the, the gray torus shape is the frame comes undone because the, the two essentially he described and Slutsky says this, the, the composition turns itself inside out, the frame collapses into a point, and then you are now in the blankness around a, an originary point. It's a lot thinking that's a lot like the diamond to the buy house perhaps, but this Slutsky essay would probably be interesting to you. And uh, forgive me if this seems uh, insensitive to show, this is from a Rosalind Krauss essay of the same period She's describing that Man Ray put the cruciform, the frame around the, the anatomy, the, the buttocks. The body is just shown with shadow and she says it dissolves into the flatness and the blankness of the page. And Man Ray, by drawing the frame around it, kept the body from dissipating into blankness. And then finally, the third thing from that same period of time, Jacques Derrida. <laughs> Uh, obviously talking about frames, he's going into Aragon and Perergon, is the drapery around the body, uh, Perergon, extra to the Aragon, and is it as a frame that you need to supersede? But in all of this, it's like 80s post-structuralist battles with, do I need to make a frame to make emptiness? Do I need to make a frame to enunciate meaning? And you know, I, I do a lot around history and theory, but I'm not I'm not Mark Wigley or Michael Hayes or Sanford Quinter. So it's uh, I'm really so the reason I'm willing to kind of obnoxiously show that is that moment in your project where the video panned by it looked like two glass walls and you could look between them. There was a moment when the camera is going from one space to the other, and it looks like it's about halfway through. And you're yeah, you're looking right there. Like you divide the two spaces and then you put space in the divider. In other words, like what is a division keeps breaking down and then you're trying to remove divisions. I mean, I, I think you you obviously don't need to be a his, history theory person to do your project. Uh, the, you know, designers are designers. But I, in your case, I really do feel like you are in this kind of tortured world where you frame something so that you can unframe it. Oh, I mean, nice. I mean, not the. I mean, one reason, you know, one reason Greg Lynn. I, yeah, I wasn't at Columbia. I I did a book called Slow Space in the '90s, and it involved half of the Columbia faculty, so I ended up at Columbia. But 
but I always thought Greg Lynn was just like monstrously important back then. He still is, but because by going into movement and going into calculus, the argument was you no longer framed anything. You actually embodied movement itself rather than making some, your word was discretize, you know, to make something discrete and then try to make it undiscreet. Greg would say, why bother doing that? I can use calculus and I can use movement. But you, you should be, if you haven't read Rosalind Krauss's 1970s book, uh, Passages in Modern Sculpture, like that whole book was a meditation on structuralist parceling of time versus an attempt to unparcelize time after you have, of course, parcelized it. And that goes into labor and money and experience and commodities. But I, I love what you're doing. Um, it's uh, Andrew's right to bring up that period of time, the single surface project. Yeah, I, I want to address, Jeff, that. Jeff, I want, I want to address yeah. that a little bit, if I could. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to squeeze a huge amount into ten five minutes but, there. So, uh, and I would, I, I would agree, but I thought, I think the strength of the project and the absurdity of it is a kind of trapped, uh, 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 soft solid that's never exposed. And I think I disagreed with Lorenzo during the summer about it. He proudly wants to let it come out and be a seat and a stare and all these things. And I kept pushing it back in and saying, no, seal it up. Uh, this is a kind of rectangular thing that has this ghost inside, which I thought was kind of absurd and really interesting. And when I look at the plants and sections, it created this poche that was basically air, is that illuminous spot. And it, for me, it was a real very interesting idea that then the effects and the reasons for the animation were to get movement behind a kind of glossy, uh, planar surface that was like a trapped kind of thing. I mean, I, I thought that was uh, kind of brilliant and finally did get to his notion of blankness. So for me, every time it comes out, I was like, oh, stop, you don't need it. Uh, whether or not it's uh, maybe the, the formal language and its position in history and, 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 and maybe a little bit retro, I don't know. But conceptually, I thought it should be suppressed. And back but John, that would, project. I mean, the way I, the way I intuitively feel, if, if I, I like what you're saying a lot, but it, let's just say this thing never kind of entered the space with you, the user, the person would be sort of perpetually beside the building, not in it. Right. You know, meaning you'd kind of in blankness. It's um I'm wondering so, there's there's a looking at the uh the renderings, um there's a little discrepancy and maybe maybe it's me, but it's between the walls and the ground, uh the walls and the floor. Uh, that it just, you know, it's just normalized. There isn't any sort of kind of, in, in some cases you might see it, in other cases just, just see the wall hitting the floor. And and that sort of takes, uh, it, it, it kind of sort of takes away from me from the more um, blankness, I, I, I guess, uh, or it takes a little bit of the, from the blankness of the idea of, being inside these these four walls, which which I look at this project as four walls. Um, uh, so it's just you know maybe that was an, an issue that did not get resolved, or is there a reason why the single surface works in certain parts and not in other parts? I don't know. Is that that's a question. Could you could you identify one of uh, those moments? So I'm yeah. If you go back to where Michael was uh, looking at the, uh, was asking for that uh, detail, for instance, um, and and maybe it's me, uh, right there. Stop, uh, right there where on on the left side that wall and floor condition, is that is that a, a ninety degree angle no, no, on the left side? Yeah, uh, between what is the floor and the wall? Uh, is that a continuous, is there a continuous surface there that, or is it just a 
wall coming into the floor? Uh, so the way it works is, is I think this section might be easier to describe it. Um, so these sections are, are, are mostly to just represent the idea. They're not fully detailed. But so the, the, it's almost like the, the white uh, or the concrete shape and, uh, form never really actually touches the glass except in the fins that are just for structural reason. Otherwise, it would just be floating. So there's, again, there's this idea of contains and container. And so uh, the only moments where there is an intersection between the glass and the, the, the concrete form is when it does push out. For example, this table does push out out of the floor through the glass um, into a moment where you can actually interact with the building. Another thing that I also uh, wanted to mention is that um, the building overall, uh, when, when, you look at, when you look at it from the outside, it's, it's a glass box, right? And it's a glass box that has been extracted and excavated mm -hmm. uh, and slightly sh tilted for an easier entrance to the courtyard. Um, but there's also another idea within it, which is represented in this last scene, which is um, you, when you enter the building, you think you entered the building, but you actually you didn't. You entered the container, and it's in this example of the room where you actually go through the glass wall that you enter essentially the poche, you enter the concrete um, uh, form. So there's uh, the layering is not just a layering of material, but a layering of, of how the space ends up working out. Mm. Is it like a prison? <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't. I mean, the container certainly traps the the concrete form, but no, I don't think so. Who, who's got that? Andrew's got that. Okay. Did you ever, did you ever um, uh, read Octavio uh, Paz's uh, uh, famous uh, little poem called Envoy? And it's it it says, uh, "Imprisoned by four walls, I wrote a message." but received no reply. Uh, and uh, there's in between those, those, those two parts of the message, there's descriptions of the four walls. Um, so it, uh, when I saw your project, it reminded me of that. It, it sort of, um, I mean, the renderings and, and the computer graphics sort of show the, a great intent and a great idea, but I'm, I'm really, you know, at the end, it's sort of, uh, is it an imprisonment or is it a, uh, you know, just a you know a a a space a spatial experience, um, uh, liberating. I would say. I don't know. Just had to say that. I think Renee. Yeah, you know, all along, somebody who spent a lot of time at Columbia. Uh, Toshi Oki, he was project architect for the Toledo Glass Pavilion. And uh, years ago at Columbia, we did a four part series of conferences on materials and, and we made books of them. One of the first one was on glass and Sejima had a huge role in that project because of uh, Toledo. And, but Toshi was lived through many of Sejima Sano's buildings. And he described that the more she became well known around the world and was traveling, she would come back to the office and have to answer 5,000 questions that everybody had because she was absent. And he said she would come to everybody's table and after listening, she would erase what they drew and say, there, the problem's gone. And uh, essentially kept, you know, she would remove all the complexity from the buildings and of course then get more. So I say that because I, I do, I think you have this idea of like in manufacturing, like, you know, whether it's automobiles, they call it a bill of materials. It's every part and what it weighs and costs, et cetera. And like the Tesla Model 3 has a dramatically reduced bill of materials compared to the Model X. So yeah, you're Renee bringing up Octavio Paz as a kind of existential <laughs> relationship to that versus, you know, the people figuring out Model 3 versus X. Model X has those insanely complicated doors um and sejima just saying well i've been gone for three weeks and <laughs> erasing what they were doing and saying there it's blank now um 
And he meant that, that she really would do that. Like you guys have created all this complexity and you didn't need it. And you, you, you required me to come home and tell you that. Um, so I, I think, I think broadly speaking, what you're onto is amazing, but I do think, I mean, if I was super direct, I'm never direct enough on crits. You don't want to get stuck in an eighties quagmire about deconstruction and frames. Um, to, and that John, I think you, I, I don't know you so well other than crits, but, uh, but I love where you keep kind of zeroing in on a, on a moment in the drawing, like, and saying there's a moment when the thing is going off track or, uh, you know, because this is a design studio and not a history theory course. And I, I definitely, I find that powerful to do that. I, I didn't buy the bench, like extending, I, I feel like I'm in a Liz Diller building and I, you know, and that happened, you know, her cafe at Alice Tully Hall, nobody can, it's like an $80 million room and they can't sell enough coffee to have that a public space. It's supposed to be public space, but it's like an $80 million public space. Um, and it's got counters that become diving boards and. Uh, you should, yeah, you should read uh, Hemingway, right. how he edited himself. Yeah, Sorry, I got a note. Yeah, leaving. I just wanted to say thank you to Drake for for the, uh, your time today. Thank you, Drake. Thank you, Drake. Hey, thank Drake. you, Drake. Oh, thank you're you very much. welcome. You're welcome. Look very good. forward to meeting everybody in person someday. Okay. Michael, we could talk for days. I could. I, I would uh, enjoy that. No, I, I can't. I'm. I'm look forward to meeting you again. Yeah. Sure. Bye. Thank you. Well. Uh, Maybe uh, Lorenzo, you can unshare and we can just gather and uh, thank everyone if there are any other students who are still around <laughs> and not uh, at the virtual party. Oh, there's a, another virtual party. I'll put that in the chat. That's uh, the party after this. If anybody wants to go and say <laughs> hi uh, to each other, but I want to thank all the jurors and if they have any final comments uh, for the students. And of course, thank all the students. Uh, great afternoon and you all did fantastic. Isn't this where we ask the students to leave so we can decide whether they're graduating or not? <laughs> <laughs> congratulations, guys. Hey, congratulations, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And by the way, we already received our diplomas, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, I would like to ask, uh, Michael, you gave some really interesting references. And since this is something that I want to keep working on, um, uh, I if can possible, send them you to could. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very if much. You, if you email me, uh, MJB92, yeah, Columbia. Okay. Thank you it's, very much. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll share those with you. I, you, I won't, I talk too much, but uh, John and Andrew and everybody, what I found really inspiring was the degree to which these are really experimental and Although they're claiming social relevance, which of course is utterly critical right now, I think they're on the edge between trying to figure out when and how something could be that internal and that public. And uh, that's a real question. Um, Renee, you're good for, well, a lot of you guys are good friends with Jeff Kipnis. Jeff Kipnis was pretty hard on me many times because he thought I'd given away <laughs> too much of my work to economics and the politics and uh and i whenever i see them i feel like i have to address that but in your <laughs> case i feel like all these projects are really asking that um and and heuristically speaking you guys are working in a kind of internal way isolated from each other and so it's an impressive body of work yeah i want i want to thank for inviting me i mean i had been in a review for a while at SciArc, I think the last time I was there was for Selner <clears throat> and um, in another uh, program, I think it was uh, more urban, but uh, it's great to see sort of the variety uh, and how this generation is sort of shaping um, kind of the new ideas at, uh, at SciArc, which I, which I really enjoy. And um, and uh, and that was also not only your projects, which um, are very di diverse, but I was looking at the other 
uh, other presentations and there were uh, video presentations. Uh, there were uh, many uh, sort of the uh, ways of narrative, uh, narrating a project, which for me was, was, was really fresh. Uh, so it's, it, of course you had the, um, uh, like Priyanka, her, her work as, you know, very sort of deliberate architectural techniques, how, how they went to also um, somebody just basically making a film and sort of narrating a kind of um, sort of conceptual uh, position in, in, in architecture. And I think for me, a lot of those are valid. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why, and so I wish Sire keep on doing that and, and expressing itself in, in many, many, many ways. So congratulations. Yeah, just, you know, thank you for having me. As always, it's, uh, it's fun. And I, again, I'm so sad that we cannot do it in person. Sayag reviews are just like wild. So I always love coming, <laughs> coming back. But uh, nevertheless, I really enjoyed this afternoon. And I also, I have to personally say that I really appreciated that each one of these projects was at the end of building. That the questions, the thesis questions were asked through a building. Um, and I know that each one of them kind of tackled a different issue, uh, but it, all of you were really trying to kind of figure out how to um, explore, you know, either typology or, or concepts as abstract as blankness uh, through real buildings and the kind of design of buildings and how they're situated, uh, how they're how they're articulated and so forth. And so. Um, each one of them also had a very different strategy of doing so, which I really appreciated. Um, so I would just encourage you guys all to, and many of you mentioned that, but not to just stop now, right? Whatever you kind of uh, took on as a thesis project, hopefully at least fuels your next few steps, uh, thinking about how you might, you know, think, uh, what the profession of architecture means for you and how you want to actually engage it in the world uh, at large uh, through some of the questions that you've been asking the past few months. Uh, but at the end, it's really up to you to craft that conversation and to kind of engage by a larger, larger audience. So congratulations, though. It really, like, uh, all, all these projects, like, really well done. Yeah. I, by the way, I just want to mention, Miroslava, uh, at yep. SciArc, working out things through buildings is pretty much the default, is what we all do. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> um, you know what I mean. <laughs> I didn't see, I don't see, no, I don't uh... Drake asked about the neighborhood more close. I don't, nobody's got some data on neighborhoods or incomes or household makeups or, yeah, poverty. Uh, no, it's not. Yeah, that, you're right, Andrew. There's definitely buildings. I, I, I'm not sure I've seen much social data or, or at SciArc. Well, just having this many buildings show up at SciArc is itself a bit of a miracle. So. It is. <laughs> <I can. laughs> Uh, One step so, at a time. We'll get the spreadsheet. No. <laughs> it's an incredibly impressive group. Um, some of you are living, like Natu, you have, is that your art behind you? <laughs> that is, yes. It's a prop That's, I made for a music video. Yeah, it's... it's they let me keep it afterwards, so... <laughs> no, and, and, and Zoe has the work behind her, and uh, yeah, Priyanka, you're in your apartment or loft or something, yeah. Uh, Eli's got a thermostat behind him, I think. Um, I think he designed. Uh, well, you've got some. <laughs> you've got something hanging on the thermostat. <laughs> yeah. It's this is a. I too miss the. I would love to do this in person, but uh, for the moment, obviously Zoom has produced some interesting other qualities too. Yeah, mm -hmm. you guys will have to think that through. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. Bye. Good night. Hey, congratulations. Bye. Bye. Thank Congrats. you. Bye. Thanks, John. Bye, Andrew. Michael, Renee.